we did our we did a pretty good we got that presentation class today. Bless your heart. And now we're all the still be tomorrow. That might not have been that Saturday. Because we've got Morris. Uh good afternoon. The time is 503 p.m. on October 12th, 2022. And this meeting of the District of Columbia State Board of Education is now called to order. This month's working session is being held in person at the Marion S. Berry Jr. Building. However, in-person attendance is limited to members and staff of the State Board. The working session is being streamed live on the State Board's YouTube page for members of the public to attend and engage. The State Board will, again, meet in the old Council Chambers for our October 19th public meeting later this month. Visit sboe.dc.gov to learn more about submitting and or presenting testimony. The roll will now be called to determine the presence of a quorum. Mr. Chu, would you please call the roll? Uh, Representative Bernstein? Here. Representative Burgess? Representative Burgess? Representative Wages? Representative Wages? Representative Washington? Here. Representative Soy here. Representative Chang. Representative Chang. Representative Wattenberg. Present. Representative O'Leary. Here. Representative Parker. Present. Representative Sutter. Present. Representative Thompson. Present. Representative Reed. Representative Reed. And Representative Patterson. Representative Patterson, and I do see that Representative Burgess has joined via the Zoom. Uh, that's President Report. Thank you. A quorum has been determined, and the State Board will now proceed with our meeting. So we'll start with our leadership report. We have a lot of updates today, so please bear with me. Uh, welcome to our October 12th working session. Last time we were all together was the State Board, uh, well, a couple of times ago when we were together, was the State Board Public Engagement held September 24th at Eastern Senior High School in Ward 7. Thank you to the 60 plus community members who came out to attend the event. It was a very busy day at Eastern High School, so we appreciate people bearing with us to get into the event. We appreciate the members, the staff of the board, Principal Miller of Eastern High School, and all the participating community organizations who helped make the event happen. We were grateful to have participation from the Office of the Ombudsman and the DC Special Education Hub, the Office of the Student Advocate, the Washington Teachers Union, and YMCA's DC Youth and Government. We are going to meet again this week, members, on October 14th, Friday afternoon, in person from 1 to 4 p.m. here on the 11th floor uh, for a state board fall retreat. Pursuant to DC Code 2575B12, this retreat will be closed to the public for the purpose of training and developing members of a public body and staff. So this meeting will not be live streamed for the public. The retreat will include discussions on state board processes, their codification, and plans for future orientations, both for state board members and for agency staff. We will circulate an agenda to members tomorrow, and I'm grateful to everyone who provided input on the Google form Alex sent out. It really helped us shape the agenda, and I hope you all see that when, uh, when you have it in hand. I will also be reaching out to a few of my colleagues to solicit your help to facilitate discussions amongst our colleagues. I think it'll be a better retreat. We've got multiple folks facilitating. Next, a couple of updates on hiring. We are, as you know, hiring two additional staff for the board. We're hiring a permanent executive director and an education standards specialist. We're gonna defer discussion of the education standards specialist to Mr. Ju when he gives his interim ED report. Um, as I shared in an email to staff and members on Friday, we have made an offer to one of the finalist candidates to become our new executive director of the DC State Board. I've worked with DCHR over the past week to complete this hiring process as quickly as possible uh, and with a goal of having our new PD on board in November. I'll keep you all updated as the process moves ahead and we'll put forth the ED nomination at our November working session for a confirmation vote at the November public meeting. If our new ED is able to begin before the confirmation vote, they will be considered acting until such time as a full board can vote to confirm. 
Um, any questions on that before I move ahead? Great. Uh, next update is a really exciting one. I know members of the board have long been concerned about school facilities and the health of our school facilities. So I am pleased to announce that the state board was awarded a $10,000 grant from NASB to support our participation in the Healthy Schools Facility Network. The network's goal is to build and enhance the capacity of states to provide healthy school facilities by helping participating state boards of education form collaborative teams of state and local experts to analyze state-level data and programming, convene stakeholders, and take targeted concrete actions towards creating healthy school facilities free from environmental harms. Our team is still being finalized, but Vice President Thompson and I have been reaching out to our agency partners and others in the state. Uh, we have confirmed participation from 21st Century School Fund, Mary Center, the Deputy Mayor for Education, and the GWU School of Public Health. The final team will end up being four to eight people in size, and we're happy to talk with members if you have additional suggestions of folks to whom they should reach out. There's an in-person meeting to kick off the network at the NASB conference in Phoenix, uh, and Vice President Thompson and other members of our team will be attending. Alex may say more about this in his ED report as well. Next up is council hearings. There were some recent council hearings at which the board was a government witness. There are also some upcoming council meetings uh, and wanted to share some updates there. You should have received in your email a wonderful summary of the financial literacy hearing that Lauren put together. Uh, I'm happy to answer any additional questions you may have about that hearing, but I think it was a good hearing with Chairman Mendelssohn. Uh, unfortunately, he was the only council member who was present for questioning of witnesses. So uh, it was a good conversation, though limited in its participation. In two weeks, there is a council of uh, committee of the whole hearing on teacher and principal turnover and retention in the district. Uh, Bill 24-355, Statewide Data Warehouse Amendment Act 2021. I will be testifying on behalf of the board as a government witness at that hearing on October 25th, and we'll circulate a draft of testimony to members for your comment and input likely early next week. Uh, as you know, because of our working session being rescheduled due to the holidays this month, we're on a kind of tight agenda this week and next week, but we hope to have it out to you next week. Finally, I thought I'd keep you all apprised of upcoming leadership meetings with our agency partners so that you can know when we'll plan to report out. So on Monday, October 17th, we have meetings with both the Deputy Mayor for Education and with OSI. Uh, that will be a busy day. Um, we do not have a meeting with the chairman this month. We will have a meeting with the chairman on November 3rd. It will be after our next working session. So we'll try to provide members with an update on the TME and OSI meetings before the next working session. And then our meeting with the chairman will update you all on after the next working session. We are still awaiting an update from the chairman on a briefing with the council on SBOE work and priorities. We would hope that would happen early this month. I know the chairman uh, was out sick for a little while, so we will keep you all updated as that gets scheduled. I think that's it for me. So I am pleased now to turn to our interim executive director, Alexander Duke. Thank you, Vice President. Um, our members have any questions. I'm happy to see. Actually, um, about the grant, the Healthy Schools grant, um, will we have time to talk more about what that will look like, like with the rollout and the timeline and all of that? Yeah, I think we can. Um, that might be a good topic for the report. Uh, sorry, for the retreat. We're not discussing any matters that would have to be voted on. Um, we are still working, just so you know, on figuring out how the funding even gets to the state board, Yeah. Uh, how we can receive a grant. So we don't have any information on that yet and so have no current plans for expenditure. At part of this kickoff meeting at the NASB conference, the team will begin to discuss okay. an action plan then. So right now, I don't have more to share other than what we share. We can certainly make sure that members have a copy of the application that we submitted uh, and that was accepted. It was a very short, like, three question application. What's the president on me? We did. We need to thank interim executive director Hugh for getting it done. One second, a quick turnaround. Super quick turnaround. Uh, literally, it was like we saw it. There was a deadline immediately, and he was like, "Do you want to apply or not?" Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Like, That's yeah. really cool. We yeah. thought it was a helpful point of leverage to get our voices in this conversation that we have long held in itself. Right. All right. Cool. Looking forward to learning more. Yeah, Representative Watford. Um, well, first, congratulations to the team for pursuing this and getting it straight. 
one um, perhaps helpful note is we did once have a NASB grant. So there is some history in how that was taken. In yeah, I appreciate that. I think Roma has been aware of that and is working uh, to sort of go back to that and figure out if the same mechanism is possible to use to receive it. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Juniper. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so first, I will say, uh, President Sutter, Vice President Sutter, but uh, the chairman and staff did get back to me. They apologize that there was not a meeting that they're going to hope to do. Okay. okay. So the items that I had are one, uh, President Sutter mentioned um, a couple of conferences or one conference, um, the NASB conference. Uh, so that would be at the end of this month. Um, we're also going to be attending the Aurora Symposium at the end of this month too virtually. Um, so we have some presentations that will be done um, at the Aurora Symposium. Um, Representative Bernstad and Representative uh, Jones Burgess are going to be presenting on student voice and advocacy. Um, which will be very exciting for them. And then at the NASB conference, we have Representative Bernstein again and Representative Washington uh, presenting a similar presentation on student voice, as well as I believe Representative Soy and Representative Wattenberg uh, presenting on school climate um, and school climate. So, uh, so we look forward to those presentations um, and having our work uh, showcased on a national stage. Um, other things I know I would like to, to thank. Um, Caitlin Tang for all her work in this area, but we are working uh, very diligently on the updates to the old council chambers. I know many of us witnessed and experienced the audiovisual issues that we had during our public meeting. Uh, we have a meeting this Friday that we hope to remedy most of those things. Um, and I would again like to thank Caitlin for all her assistance with uh, figuring many of those things out. Um, my next update is on Friday, the state board did re receive its FY24 mark. Um, and for members who are familiar with the budget process, um, that is a budget number that is delivered up, delivered to us by the mayor's team. Um, I have yet to formally review all the documents, but um, I do have a conversation with um, part of the executive uh, tomorrow to talk through the FY24 budget. So we continue to move forward with that. Um, I received an email earlier today or maybe yesterday. Um, this is a great opportunity, I think, for continuing board members. Um, the National Assessment Governing Board is actually looking for a state board of education member to sit on their governing board. And for members um, who are not familiar, this is the board that oversees the NAEP assessment. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity and potential, again, I think, to be a great opportunity probably for continuing members, such that I believe the application is due at the end of this month and would likely be something for a forthcoming term. Um, and so any members who might be interested in that opportunity, please let me know and I can share that information with you. And then my last update, um, as President Sutter shared, in addition to the hiring of a permanent executive director of the state board, is also working to hire an education standards specialist. Um, and we are moving through that process and hope to have a candidate identified within about a month's time so that they can join our team as well and help us with our education standards of focus work. So I think right now we might have about five or so final moments that we're going. And that is everything on my list. So I will turn it back to you, President Sutter, for members for questions. Any questions for members for Mr. Duke? Okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Duke. Um, for your report, we are now going to turn to our colleagues at Aussie uh, for roughly 30 minutes for a presentation uh, on a proposal to stagger the 100 hour community service graduation requirements um, that we discussed at our September working session. So, if you recall, we had a presentation at that session. And so, following this working session, the state board will review the proposal from Aussie, continue to solicit constituent feedback from members of the public if you're watching. You have feedback. Our public meeting next week will be an excellent time to submit testimony or to come present testimony to the board on this matter. Uh, we'll accept feedback over the coming weeks, and a plan to vote on any changes is likely to occur at the November 16th public meeting next month. We welcome Mr. Andrew Gall, Deputy Chief of Staff for Legislative Affairs and Policy, and Mr. Justin Tooley, Chief of Staff 
to share Aussie's community service requirement proposal. Mr. Gall, Mr. Tooley, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And you created the shout out earlier to the YMCA government program. That was my first foray into the government. So, um, <laughs> not working. Not working. <laughs> they didn't teach you about tech. No, that's it. It's working on your. I was going to say, do we have changes about technical difficulties? I think that's not in our bylaws. It's literally the advanced Every time you I'll just do it. Okay, we'll see what happens. Um, so, as a reminder, um, we spoke about staggering at the requirements last uh, month, and you guys gave feedback, and we appreciated that opportunity. Since that time, we have reached out to DCS and DCSB to receive feedback from them as well. Um, and so we've incorporated feedback that we've gotten into a proposal that we are presenting to you tonight. Um, and uh, as the agenda states, uh, going over first the staggering of the hours requirement, also accommodating transfer students, uh, change in the definition for community service, and then uh, provide some examples and not examples of what would be covered under the new definition of community service. Uh, so on the next slide, this is the current definition. Um, it says in addition to the 24 carded units, 100 hours of volunteer community service will be satisfactorily completed. The system of volunteer community service projects shall be established by the uh, and um, this is some of the feedback that we have uh, heard as we have done the engagement, both with you all and others. Um, so some stakeholders have expressed that the 100 hour requirement uh, is difficult for students to obtain. Others have pointed out that um, the LEA's uh, definition right now is very nebulous so that they can sort of define uh, what, what counts as community service in very strict ways. Um, also transfer students have to meet the 100 hour requirement as is, even if they come in at the last semester currently, there's no, there's no wiggle room there. Um, specifically to the pandemic, we've heard that there was issues in terms of completing community service because of safety protocols. Um, and that the, for the last three years, the community service requirement has been waived. So students may not have been prioritizing um, getting all of 100 hours. Um, and lastly, we know that timely action is necessary so students in schools know what they will be required for students to graduate this, this year. Uh, so for staggering the hours requirement, um, it is uh, our proposal to do 25 uh, per year. So for students graduating this year, they would have to complete 25 hours of community service next year. In 2024, 50 hours. In 2025, 75 hours. 2026, thereafter, 100 hours. So staggering 25 hours per year. Uh, for transfer students, and just as a little bit of background on this, uh, the District of Columbia is part of the uh, military compact on education. And there was some feedback, especially from, from families, uh, from military families, that the lack of transfer uh, flexibility was difficult for their families. Um, I know I have cousins and, and uncles who were in the military and changed um, schools like 20 times within their, their elementary er, and secondary uh, education time. And so you might be coming in um, 
at the last semester and then have to make all 100 hours. So, uh, and this would also apply to, to other transfer students as well, but for anybody coming from outside the District of Columbia, uh, then the proposal would be to um, have their future hours, they would have to complete, but the ones that uh, in terms of their years, they would not have to make up. So if they're a senior, then the hours would be waived. Junior, they would have to do 25 hours. Uh, as a sophomore, 50 hours. If they come in during the middle of their freshman year, then it would be 75 hours. Uh, hopefully I can explain it. Um, next, we have a change in the definition of community service. So uh, as I uh, laid out before, the current definition is quite nebulous. And we heard from feedback at our last working session that there were uh, examples of LEAs who said, you could only count community service if for a 501c3 um, organization. And so what we're proposing is to make the language uh, more broad so that other types of service can also be uh, incorporated. So uh, the proposal says, LEAs shall approve voluntary unpaid community service that is intended to provide a societal benefit. LEAs shall approve community service completed through activities within the school organized by the school through a nonprofit or profit organization or in a virtual setting. Um, so for example, tutoring, um, if you're a high school student, tutoring a, an elementary school student through uh, uh, an online platform. To, to count. Um, so note to that the uh, language shall and not may. So that I might still think about that. Um, and then just a couple more examples on the next slide of what would count and what would not count under this definition. So uh, community cleanup of, of trash for an organization, that would count. Uh, service on a public body or committee, perhaps as a student representative, mm -hmm. that could count. Um, service as part of a course conducted during instructional time, volunteering for a political campaign, all of that would count. Um, what would not be permitted are activities for which the student is compensated, um, and activities for the private benefit of the student or the student's family. So for example, babysitting, sitting. Some of these examples here are some of the questions that are raised in our engagement with PC students. Yeah. Um, for example, we did get some um, feedback from the CPS regarding, like, could you set up courses that have community service as a part of it? Yes. Like, Please go do that. That's okay. <laughs> yes, go do that. Uh, we should not stop that. We can make that very clear. Um, we think that there should be some instructional piece if it's a course for credit, uh, but we can work that out in a different way. But yes, that that would count. Can it do things in the school building? Yes, it can. Can it do things organized by the school? Of course it can. Um, but then we got to some things uh, also that, well, what about co ops and internships and things like that? We're like, that's more of sort of your body, your body, right? But that is not what we need to require. Can I ask what was added? The permitted community services, are, are those all uh, holdovers from before or some of them new? Our examples? Mm -hmm. we, we've never made it to the point. Right? But um, we wanted to be very clear about what the fact the, the advanced English department is very committed to our I think we had talked a little bit about an example about babysitting, like sort of yeah. like private game the last time so we did that on the uh, Very common on trash um, I think in our engagement last time, we had uh, some back about the student government or what the public body, you know, representing on the public body. Sounds good. So that's always been allowed. I'm no, right? It's been unclear. It's we're trying to make we're trying to make that right. so go back to the government. I was saying, so can I repeat that I think LEAs were allowed to determine what counted. So the CPS might have had community trash cleanup count, but maybe insert charter school here, it didn't. 
And so this is aiming to say that the state is going to list the definition of and these are examples that the state mm -hmm. is providing that all okay. LDAs would have to honor. So go back to this, this piece here. So you can see the specific college. So this the current language gave a lot of room for LDAs to determine what was credible. Right. So what we're proposing is a change that gives and says, okay, no LDA, you must, you must approve this. Got it. In any type of arrangement that is like this, should be valid. Okay. Valid. Okay. Good to know. Are there other questions at this point, or do you want to wait until we get through the time? Let's take the questions. Okay, it looks like a couple. So, Representative Bernstadt is going to go first, and then I'm going to come to the adult members in turn. Um, I have a question about the payment. Um, I know, obviously, that clearly, like hourly wages or salary worries or whatever, it would not count as community service, but I know there's a lot of community service programs like you know, that offer, like, Small stipends at the completion of a course would that still count as community service because they're advertised as like community service opportunities? I can you give more? Can you? Yeah. Can so you like, there's a program where you meet like I don't know twice every month, and then at the end of the program you get service hours, but you also get like a I think it was like hundred dollar stipend or something. That's not like hourly wages similar to babysitting or a lot of internship programs, um, but it's just extra. Or like the state board, we get community service hours, but we also technically also get a cycle. I don't think we would expand upon the same language. Okay. But I think what we could what this would look like would be something like I could see somebody doing something as a stipend to help defray the cost of transportation or something like that. Like that would not be compensation. I'm talking about any of our wage. Like that, that's not what we would do. So if it was a stipend, it'd be like, all right, here's your transportation or a lunch stipend or something like that. Like that sounds to be more of the spirit of what you're describing, correct? Yes, but there's also some that are just like stipend just for the students or that. Sure. I mean, if, if you can bring me an example, some examples of what you're talking about, we'll try to take. I think what we're looking at here is like for a wage. Okay. You is it for your we are paying you for service. That would not be the community service. Okay. There's something, there's something about the element if that there's something about doing free work yeah. for the public good that we're trying to get. Okay. Um Representative Bernstein, do I also understand you have a statement from the SAC for tonight? Um yeah, but I think that can be later because it's about the staggering of the hours. Okay. So I'll go to the adults reps for questions. And then as we're wrapping this up, I'll turn back to our students for a statement. Does that sound okay? Okay, Dr. Patterson. I did. Well, right here. Well, yeah, I didn't have Oh, okay. Here. Representative Watford. Um, so I have, first of all, I think a lot of this is great. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. I have um, an overall concern, which I want to raise at the end, but now I just have a bunch of questions. So let me just throw out a bunch of questions. Um, So what so what would happen if say a group of so one thing I really like is this idea that schools could organize their own classes for it. And part of what I like about that, and I wonder if you might want to make it a bigger thing, is my sense is a lot of schools didn't take a lot of ownership of this. The kids were really just left to just go figure things out and they were you know, some of them were good and some of them were silly and et cetera, et cetera. And that's a lot of what I think we heard before when we sort of worked on this as a state board. And I think getting the schools involved would really help that a lot, really encouraging that. Related to that, what if a group of students decided to, our community service for the five of us is we're gonna clean up our neighborhood, you know, every, you know, one, one Monday, one Saturday a month. Does that count as, I mean, that's not, they're not a nonprofit. They're not in a course. It's the students doing it themselves. I mean, something to think about, would that count and how would that work? Could see it being something they do as part of the class, right? They're different. A plus. Okay. A plus. plus. Right. You've got a future in this. That's good. All right, let's do that. Thanks, Ray. Um, you're a good bill writer. That's pretty good. Okay, one 
one question that came up last time was to include the work, not the work the service of students did a lot of times in churches, including choirs. Does that count? Does that profit? So that would be a non profit because you might as well make it. Yeah. Um, okay, actually, shall I just make my obviously make my other comments now? Yeah. yeah. So one is the, the one thing. So we heard when the state board did a task force on this, I guess it's now five years ago, we heard a lot from students and other people that it, it was too much time. So, and, so now I'm not talking about worrying about that it's a pandemic and it's all coming at one time, but that $100 was too much. So a couple of things. One is if you made it clear that you really supposed to do 20 hours, um, 25 hours a year, that really feels a lot less than 100. So something to think about. Um, but I also want to hear from students about it. And I'm thinking that at our next, for next week, that one thing we could do, and this goes right along with what you were saying, is to really publicize in a big way that we want to hear from students at our October meeting about how many hours is the right amount of hours. It's 100 hours, a good amount if it's strongly organized, blah, blah, blah. Because I want to hear, and I want to, and I would like for them to respond to this. In other words, if it's going to look like this, people now feel like that's a good uh, a good proposal. Um, and relevant to that also is I think there's a whole, I mean, there's a task force report on this and a bunch of testimony. I think we should go back to that task force report that the board did and just pull out all the comments on this 20, on the 100 hours and just make sure it's being um, handled. And, uh, oh, and one thing that would be, this, this would just add to your to-do list which you may, may not want to do. It would be really interesting to survey some of the students who have gone through it, just to sort of see what they liked and didn't like to um, see how this responded. And, and I'll just say, all this is coming from me. I really came into this meeting feeling like everything I've heard is 100 hours is too much. And I'm very disposed that way. But this is very impressive. And I can see a lot of good ideas and a lot, a lot of different ways of going about it and more involvement in school. So I would say it's shifted here. I want to hear how other people respond to that. As I'm sure you do. So we still need to go to the student advisory committee. I think we would be amenable to uh, figuring out some sort of survey tool that they can share and do this. Uh, I think that when we engaged LEAs, we did not hear. Well, we're engaging all LEAs tomorrow uh, in our monthly. So. In our discussions with DCS and DCSD, uh, we didn't get a lot of feedback on the hours. Like the app, it was the opportunities, like giving kids more opportunities, but, and the, which aligned with what she said. Now, I was on the graduation task force. I don't believe that the conversation that was that sophisticated to talk about the opportunities at that time. I remember us having the conversation about 150 hours, but there was still disagreement on the board. On, on the board side, now the board accepted the report, but there was still some disagreement within the, the advisory committee and even on the board at that time. Um, but uh, the report was what was agreed upon. Um, but we did not, to my knowledge, or to my recollection, talk about all of these additional books. That's something that came up in this Just learn. for members, I've asked Alex to make sure that when we meet for our November working session, that we all have had a chance to see the testimony that was part of the task force to make sure we reviewed it before our next discussion on this topic. If possible, it would be great to have it prior to the next week's meeting so that we would have that effect on. I understand 100%. I think that may be difficult given the week turnaround yeah. and the staff capacity. So mm -hmm. I think before our November 2nd working session, we can absolutely commit to it though. When it comes to Representative Parker. Yeah, uh, two questions. I will note years ago uh, in talking with four or five high school students, I too heard from students that the 100 hour limit was a lot, not, not so much for LEAs. I also heard very clearly from LEAs that they weren't gonna allow community service hours to be the barrier that kept the kid from graduating. So you could read between the lines there. But two questions. Uh, one is if a student is transferring, is it up to the LEA's discretion to accept hours from another LEA or an out of town school? And so that was an issue. There was a student from out of state who I guess racked up X number of hours that was now at a DCPS school and none of those hours transferred. 
that's one question. And um, related, if a student were not to graduate or repeated a grade in high school, would they then just roll over to the new expectation for the following year? So assuming before it presumed that 100 hours, if someone in the class of 23, would they just then be expected to do the 50 or 50 hours for the class of 24? On your first piece of feedback, let's take that as our class. But that's why we use the, on the second question, that's why we, we have said class of. So if a student, let's say a student failed this year in a first year, year so class of 24, they would go to class of 24 because they would be in that right class. Got it. Okay. And so there, those hours would apply. They would need to put the class of 24. Okay. Got it. Dr. O'Leary. Uh, I'm uh, maybe an outlier, but I, I have no problem with 100 hours of community service for four years. And I think that we are trying to, especially in these times, to have our students involved in the community and in what's going on in the world. So I don't have a, I don't have a, a quibble about, about that. What I do have is um, if a student transfers in the second half of their junior year, this year, right? How many hours will they need? 25. At, when they graduate? Yes. So that they only need 20, it doesn't, that, that year, the June, that transfer year doesn't count. So I only have to do the expectation for the following year. So Okay. We're giving them like okay. all, all their past time. They and I guess there. I guess the we have we have recently in the last couple of months had tremendous increases in population in some of our, our schools because of migrant children. And they are placed by age, as far as what I'm hearing, um, especially with high school students. Uh, so I, I know it won't be a problem this year because they don't have to have any sort of service time. But a lot of them may be coming in with no hours. Are they still only going to be respected? They came in as a junior. They would only have to have 25 the next year. Yes, so this would apply. So what happens after, and then after four years, after this this year and then next year and then next year and the year after that, it's a hundred hours for everything. So the, the transfer would be a permanent uh, situation, but that would not change. The staggered hours disappear is, after four years. Right, yeah. but the, okay. the transfer. Uh, right. Okay. Of that Thank you, um, Dr. Patterson, and then Dr. Vasoy. So I just had a question concerning the person who signs it. It says it needs to be pre-approved by the council or the coordinator, so to speak. Is that correct? That, I'm looking at the form, but I the DC form. It says it needs to be pre-approved by the coordinator or the counselor uh, for it to be legitimate. That would, that's uh, DCPS's form, so that's that's what they as the LEA decided under the current uh, requirements. Okay, so if it was a charter school, so whomever they designate. Is the approving official for that? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. I mean, okay. we don't we don't put any parameters over sort of the, how the forms that individual LEAs use or who or their operational conditions. The only thing that we would say is that whatever you put on that form, you shouldn't be making a difference if it's inside the school, outside the school, with a nonprofit, with this organization or that. And as long as it's a voluntary, unpaid experience. Then that person should the LEA that person whoever they designate to do the review shall approve that they should. Yes, I just want to be clear. Yeah. So for a charter school that's not using the CCS form, of course, it can be of any form just as long as it's pre-approved and that someone from the school from assigned. Correct. Assign them on. We're not waiting into um, like okay. that. Okay. Just want to that be clear. No, no, no. But a lot of times it gets real confused. No. The students ask who can sign, who cannot sign. We get a lot of it in the community. But I want to be clear. Okay. Thank you. I mean, if the only thing that I would say is that like the like Aussie has never 
to my knowledge, created a form and put it on LEA. So I think we've done a lot of templates. You know, okay. now if a template would be helpful, some of our smaller charter LEAs like right. us, like a, a lot when we say, hey, because they don't, they might not have the lawyer staff, they might not have the exactly. staff. staff. So we do, we have, we have done like, this is a templated policy or this is like, you can adapt and things. We could do stuff like that. It's just like triple guidance. Right. But no, we, we, to my knowledge, I can't think of a document that we're like, this, this, this has to be, this is open. Even for, even for enrollment and residents, yeah, there's still some variation of different documents. Thank you. Back to this one. Yeah, um, I just had a question um, about guidance that students get either from the LEA level or which would be more of the charter school or at the school level at ECF. Is that, have you gotten feedback on that? Is that an issue where some schools provide a lot of guidance and support for students and others don't? And students? So I think this has been a place where we've just not created any guidance on it. So the command was very heavy and gave a lot of autonomy to all of So there's two things that will change um, when we go out with the way we want to do this. It's one, there would be more parameters placed on LEAs of what they shall do. And then two, I, we will reintroduce and reorient LEAs to these to, to these legal bodies through some place like this deck, maybe a guide something. I think that table and FAQ document we can put something that explains we do that a lot for new inventory guidance. Something that explains the law or explains what the expectation is. Okay. So it's sort of a joke. Yeah. And as a parent, I'm gonna start using shell for sure. <laughs> we'll see how that works. Good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll let you know. Sometimes, you know, LEAs <laughs> don't like the word shell either. So. <laughs> then you'll be it's a corrective action. You <laughs> shell <laughs> good bit. All right, really you have another question. Uh, yeah, I have a I, I just have a scenario. Um an LEA approves the community service hours for a student. And then the student transfers to a different LEA. And that LEA doesn't approve the hours. Is that Aussies? Are y'all the arbiter in that? I, we are not the arbiter. That is what Parker was raising it. And I think that's what we can go back and get to your now. Uh, I think some of this is addressed with the new language of shall. But then we can also think, let us go back and think about how we might make that a little bit more clear uh, uh, when service is at another LEA. Good, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, my question is a bit hyper specific and um, related to LEAP. So, what if a, um, a profit? <laughs> organization um, organized the community trash cleanup, but the individual was not paid. So, like, say for instance, what if like Walmart organized the community trash pickup, and somebody would that still be counted as community? Yes, service? as long as as long as you weren't paid. It even says uh, it profit, could be right. a for profit. Walmart would be a for profit. That's fine. Okay, so would that is fine. Yeah, as long as the student's not getting paid. Like as like as long as it's for societal debt, it's not. I see. So we're saying it's not not for, it's not listed on the permitted, but it would be permitted. Yes. Not what we're trying to say with the, with the language is that approval is not the per, who you do it with. Like you do it with a church, go with a church. You want to do it at school, go with school. You can do it at a corporation, go with a corporation. You do it with a state board member, great, go for it. As long as it's unpaid and voluntary, that's that's the gist. That's what we want you to do. It's not place specific. Yeah. I guess I started. Go ahead. Uh, so first, my comment. I'm glad to see it consistent. Like just to have some this is what is because that was missing. Uh and I know I had students who had a lot of difficulty just getting stuff approved. Did they matter if they were going from LEA to LEA? Some I had students who just weren't getting out of the proof and we should fix that. Uh, Second, I think I want to make sure I understand two things. Thing one, this would go into effect when, uh, and would, and I'm assuming we would also need to communicate to the council because they've been doing emergency rulemaking the past couple of years. And, and yeah, so this will go into effect when. Uh, so that's the question, first question. Second question, we had talked about in previous discussion um, 
did it make sense to have some more engagement around what other adjustments or changes might be? Is that still something we would talk about? Or is this like, this is our proposal, we're gonna move on to some other steps because we got to work with the vote forward. Um, yeah. What's the process for so um it'd be an emergency rulemaking that we promulgate so it would go into effect this year so we want to make sure that the 25 hours that seniors who are seniors right now that would be the rule. so so would it go into effect immediately we would also have the public comment period so that'd be another opportunity to get some of that public engagement that i think you were referencing but i will just so as soon as you all approve it, the superintendent has the power to do the purpose for it. That gets us I think, 20, uh, don't want to a number of days. So that gets it started. Right. And then at that period, if you go to a public rulemaking, which is a first day to that period, I think it would be okay. Okay. So during the proposed rulemaking mm -hmm. and the comment, then people, I mean, I just I can't unknow who's just coming to us saying like hey, you know, I work a full job, right? And that's it, like, and some of the flexibility may get at that, but I also so suspect there might be other things. I think, and I think we, we, we go over this every time we do it, it's you know, it's related. so if, if there is a substantive change, like if Aussie's lawyers say in between a proposed rulemaking and a final rulemaking, the government has made a significant substantive change to rulemaking, we have to start all over. So, like, you have to go back and look at the proposal. That's why I asked, was so, there a separate process? So, I think I think what we would do, I think what we would do is, if there are other things that you are looking at fixing, I think that we we ideated on those things about like what are the most, are the biggest items. So, I would advise us to go forward with that. I think those would do a lot of good. But if there are other things that come up in the public comment period, I think we could look at those and then decide from there. Uh, what to do. I don't think you would want to start back from scratch because I can't do an emergency rule like twice. So I can't do emergency on top of emergency. Yeah. So, so um, but yes, I think with all like with with this policy, if there are new issues that we find out, I think they're I mean, but getting I, like I kind of think we will hear get rid of it or <laughs> or but I, I think we'll hear some of the conversations that we're having. I want to be mindful of a couple of questions that have come up, but I also want to be mindful of time. We're about five minutes over at this point. So I want to say that we're going to have next week's meeting. We're going to invite public comment at that meeting. And then we're going to have our November 2nd working session at which we will talk amongst ourselves about the task force commentary, anything we've heard in the public meeting. And then we'll send all that to Aussie before they hear from our students when they present to our student advisory committee. So I think that in terms of process, we have opportunities to engage the public on our end and to propose back to Asi anything else that comes up for us when we share this out with the public. Um, so perhaps this is a conversation we can also have as we approach November 2nd's working session because we will not be voting on it until November 16th at the earliest. Uh, did you have another question, Dr. Gasoy? I'm good. Okay, Representative Washington. Can I Oh, um, yes, I had two questions. Um, so my first was about it being voluntary. So say for instance, if a student was mandated by um, uh, the courts or something to complete a certain amount of uh, community service hours, would that count? <laughs> you are having a good time, aren't you? This is, this is, okay. Um, and then my second question was, um, how will, or rather, could this impact students with um, IEPs, 504s, or um, some kind of, like if they have accommodations at their school um, that specifically state that they might not be able to see this, or if they have some kind of condition that would inhibit them from completing the community service hours? So I'd be curious to hear if you, your thoughts about if a non voluntary community service opportunity should count. I think that should be an open question. The other question is, is like you you can give an accommodation. An accommodation might be the student might need to do something virtually or might have some sort of motor issue that is a 
but you can do accommodations to like water down the park. Like you can't go in an IEP meeting and say, oh no, that expect that academic learning expectation is too much. But you can't, you couldn't do that. So they would be required to meet this standard, but if they needed accommodations to get to, you know, maybe this, like for example, uh, let's say a school field trip component has a service course that doesn't if they needed transportation to where they could not, uh, could not take like Wamada or something, then that would be an accommodation. That, that, that would be an accommodation that you would need. But you wouldn't say, oh no, sir, it was going to graduation. Okay. And then um, in response to your voluntary point, I would probably say, I would say that it should count because technically these community service hours aren't voluntary in themselves because we're mandating that students complete them. So. I would be a vision cat. I'd agree. I, I, you know, <laughs> with, you know, the, I think the way that I look at it is, is that if somebody was sentenced to do community service, they might, might need more support from us rather than for the barrier. So I think maybe we should do that. So, I had two sets of questions. Um, one is around, I wonder if some of these questions that have been raised by my colleagues could be alleviated by a statewide means of data tracking this for our students. So having dealt with closing schools and transcript uh, uh, audits and the various ways in which things get approved and not approved, my question for Aussie's consideration is, could you find a place in the data you collect from LEAs on student transcript completion to collect data on community service? So that we would alleviate the problem of I transferred between this LEA, that LEA, and the other LEA before I graduated, it wouldn't matter because it would already be in the state's database of my completion, or it would be on a standard state transcript. So therefore, my 25 hours from my freshman year was transferred to my sophomore year, much in the way that universities have those transcripts when students transfer from place to place, you get a code, you get a course name, you got the hours completed. I think that would help alleviate some of these. So I submit that for your consideration. That having some means for the state to track this annually from students might be a way to do that. Can't solve that immediately, but I think that, that there are some elements of that that we can examine. Okay, appreciate that. I, I even think like transcript guidance on how it could be reported on a transcript. So that to Dr. O'Leary's point, you know, if I have this on my transcript and it says community service hours 25, it is not to put too fine a point on it, but it is none of the business of my new LEA as to whether those old 25 hours were appropriately issued or not, because my transcript says 25 hours were dead. Second thing is that I'm curious how DC currently handles students who complete high school coursework in middle school and whether or not we could do something like that to track any student hours completed in middle school. I'm thinking of my middle school scouting groups who are all over Ward 6, who I would imagine are accruing quite a bit of service hours now, much in the same way that students at Seward Hobson can take geometry in eighth grade. Certainly, they're not being required to take geometry again when they get to high school. So how do we track that now, and could we apply something similar to this? So we, we are not um, credit, like graduation courses do count. Um, you still have to have four progressively harder credits. Right? So it's like alpha one, you don't have to go back to alpha one. We expect you to be on the time to count this. But how do we know that you took alpha one? Like there's some way that gets transmitted yes, from eighth grade to high school. Through data sharing and transcripts and files. I mean, I think like, do we feel like there is so, I think one place is like, what is Aussie's role in facilitating? Yeah. Uh, and then the second piece of the question is, is that do, you know, do we think there's some value in when students do, do this? Like there are tasks that are more appropriate for our high school students to do that might be more aligned to what, you know, that we'll, you know, that we do in the real world versus something that you could do. So I think it's like, if you go and say, oh, you can meet your requirements in, you know, seventh grade, and because you know you've been doing trash cleanup, right? like maybe we're looking for high school students to do something a little bit more sophisticated. 
Um, that would be my only pause of going. And then it's like, you know, as soon as we do like break lots, 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 lots. Well, yeah, my pushback on that is just one, one fold. We're about to, I hope, super soon see some publicly available draft social studies standards, which I am told involve an action civics class in the eighth grade and a wonderful opportunity for service learning from my civics teacher part would be to have service learning as part of that action civics course. It's not a thing that would have to exist in order to graduate from high school. Like, right, you could have the action civics in eighth grade and then set students up for a lifetime of service. But it might be a way to alleviate the fact that there are students with work hours. At 14, you don't get working papers. Uh, so there's not a conflict as an eighth grader, said as someone who started working for pay her freshman year of high school. I couldn't work my eighth grade year, but I was able to get my working papers my freshman year of high school, and I did. So this would have been easier to complete if I could have done at least some of those hours before it was a conflict between wage earning and service. Two just items for consideration to be thought about. I think we could, we should come back to that. <laughs> Can I ask one really short one? Yeah. It's almost November. We're going to supposedly be voting on it mid-November. And I'm a senior in high school. I haven't had any community service hours for three years. And I've got all kinds of things that I need to think about doing besides doing community service in that little, little piece of time between January and the middle of May. Um, has there been any discussion about not beginning community service until August? So when we did, um, I think what we heard the last was that we, and you all correct me if I'm wrong, what I heard the last time was that we wanted seniors to do a little bit of something. Now we can have a conversation about what that little bit of something is. So the requirements for these graduating seniors, like they freshman year, they were not right. They could have done service. We're also providing new flexibilities for for them through where they can do it. Uh, but I think the question for the board is: is that is that enough flexibility? I think if, if, if that's if we believe that it's too burdensome, twenty five hours in this amount of time, too burdensome. Considering all these flexibilities, and they were able to do it before the pandemic, then we need to have. We should probably have a conversation about that. Happened. Uh, the last time I heard from, uh, I think at the last meeting, you all weren't open to uh, to a complete removal. Um, and so I think that we would take your feedback on that. I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't think Aussie has a significant condition on, on whether it's 25 or 20, 15 or 10. But we heard from the board you wanted to, you didn't want to do a universal way. Dr. Nope. O'Leary and Ms. Julia, I just want to turn and see if the statement that the SAC has might shed some light on this. And then I do want to move us on because we're now going to be about 20 minutes. Okay. So it's not an official statement or anything, but we got a few responses. We had some, we had two people who wanted to do nothing or only lower 75 this year. Some people wanted to start at 50 and then stagger. Um, some people wanted to permanently change it to 50 for now and forever. Uh, but then a majority of people wanted to stagger it from stagger it by 25 every year and that was split between people who wanted to start at zero now because while we did have time before COVID it was still like March so that's like half a year that's like less than 15 hours or closer to 25 a year and then we'd only have until like December and on um, so a lot of people wanted to start at zero and then stagger it up so next year 25 50 uh 75 100 but most majority a plurality of people, like I said, staggered 25, and it just depends on if they want to start at zero or start at 25. So I think that I see is majority of support of at least this part of the resolution that staggered this. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. We are going to make sure we invite members of the public to testify on the 19th. I know there are members who still have thoughts and ideas, so I imagine you would hear from members about further questions and thoughts they have, and then we will look forward to chatting with you in November. We just get a majority of votes, so we yes. understand. Yes. Well. All right. <laughs> uh, we look forward to ongoing work with Aussie, and I wish you both well, and hope that the uh, earlier events of the day do too well. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.
Take care. We're going to now turn to the next item on our agenda, a discussion on public safety issues in the district. At our previous working session in September, Vice President Thompson raised concerns over safety, the safety of students and communities in Ward 7 and across all wards, and the need for direct immediate action by the district to address these issues. Continuing this discussion, expanding on this important issue, and the fact that it has continued to be an issue for the young people of our city uh, is really important to me, and I think it's important to all of us in the board. So I'd like to spend the next 30 minutes, and I'll keep an eye on our plan at 6.03, uh, discussing community needs as related to public safety and any next steps the state board can take to advocate for communities and ensure immediate action is taken in response to public safety concerns. I will say that in uh, planning for our meeting next week, we are planning to have a panel of expert witnesses come speak to us about the topic, including folks already working on student safety in the district. So I open the floor for discussion. So can I just give some background on the expectations for this? Uh, it is first, not that we solve public safety and how to keep all of our kids safe today uh, in 30 minutes. Because I would assume that if we could do that, we would have done that by now. Uh, probably, all right, like we would keep kids safe. I think for me, uh, I, I'm i not uh, too proud to admit why I am personally at a loss uh, for just like, what is it that my schools can ask for as far as supports and what are things that uh, they just maybe should already have, like they shouldn't have to ask for. Um, and it seems to me to be um, maybe about as clear as mud how all of the different uh, services that we provide as a city and some of them contracts um, actually interact with our schools um, and some of the respective LEAs. I know that um, I had a conversation with Representative Patterson about uh, the kid, well, I have a couple kids in Ward Seven, but um, literally, I had we had I, we <laughs> had a school on lockdown uh, because someone decided they wanted to hide out across the street from the school. And like, what do you do when there's literally a shootout with police outside of a school? And how do you notify families? And we just talked about the fact that as LEAs, every single LEA is piecing it together for themselves. Or I think about how Representative O'Leary has raised many times, he asked, like, are you also seeing like increased incidences of violence in your schools? Because uh, I'm hearing that. Uh, I'm feeling that I've had parent brawls outside of school. So I, have, <laughs> I have all kinds of stuff going on. Um, and I don't think it's limited to War 7. Um, I know it's not limited to War 7. Um, but I do think as someone who represents schools and communities, it is my job to educate myself uh, and have a response uh, to be able to say back to my schools, like, okay, did you know that you should be able to, you should have a, I don't, I'm making this up, a one's office person that you can call? Uh, or did you know that there's this resource uh, from the OAG's office? And I, I honestly, I don't know if you all just know those things, but I don't. Um, and I think I, I would like to. So that's, that's kind of like some framing uh, for like the question that. The last part you're saying, the um, resources. Can you say again what you, you don't know which part? So of it. there's a bunch of like, so I mean, part of part of what I suspect uh, is like some, they live in different places. So like the office of, uh, what is that public safety? Um, and I feel like a lot of us are more familiar with the office of public safety because some other things in the news recently. <laughs> Um, but like the Office of Public Safety actually has a, they have the one's office to offer Office of Neighborhood Safety uh, and Engagement. Um, and they're supposed to have some things that do with like communities and, right. um, and violence interrupters. Yeah. And so does the OAG's office, right? And like, what's the difference between like OAG and Cure the Streets and what? And like, where's the intersection and with school and safe passage? They don't. And like, what are the, like, right. So like all, there are all these people who have charges around safety and where do they intersect? And when it comes to the case of our schools, what should they know? Uh, what should they be doing to tap into these resources um, if they're not already? Um, and are there places where it's just a question of coordination that's lacking uh, or communication? Right. Okay. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because it's, it's messy. It's messy and it's not coordinated and it's not, it's, yeah, they're not speaking to each other for the most part, as far as I can tell. Those three in particular, I don't think. Okay. 
Yeah. The uh, safe passage uh, is very helpful to to the schools uh, in Ward Four. But when I asked the people who were safe passage people, well, do, do you have uh, people in your organization that are in at Baloo or yeah. at McKinley or at another school all over the city? And we don't have safe passage people all over the city. Well, it's very specific. It's like a map of yeah. where they are. If somebody decided yeah. which wards, which places which are, aren't safe. But but that shouldn't be at all, and uh, I don't know. I, I maybe this maybe just this forum is is all we can do as a board to do something about it. But just to get it out there, because yeah. it's not fair to those students because the safe passage people are doing a really good job getting the kids out of school, getting the kids into school, getting them to the subway, getting them to the buses. But it's not happening at every school, and I don't understand right. why that is. I was actually just the other day wondering if the school could request to be added to a corridor, you know. So well, that school was... shouldn't have to request that. It's like a crossing goal. No, I know, but resources are resources, and and the oh, existing I... corridors exist. So how does a school that's experiencing, you know, issues for students and families walking to school this school happens to be like it would be convenient to add that. That wouldn't be, you know, they're on sort of that yeah. it would just be another point. But there might be schools that are outliers, you know, that would not be on an existing corridor. What do they do? I don't know who they would reach out to. So those are two questions I guess I've had recently. Yeah. And who do we ask? <laughs> so, so this very week, um, just two days ago, basically. First came back on Tuesday. Um, where I work during the day, we had to interview someone, coordinate all our efforts for our school. We're at four wards. We've seen the same problem. Four wards that we're in. Uh, no ward is worse than any other ward. They're all having the same amount of problems. Um, they're having the problems inside the school, outside the school, coordination with EDOT, as far as safety, how to get to school. What that means. Um, so we hired someone who had been um, in a lot of DCPS schools and had been in charge of them as well. So we're hoping he takes the job. But I saw that on a micro level that we don't do that at a macro level. Uh, Dr. O'Leary, what you say is absolutely true. We can have uh, some DDOT people are crossing guards here. The next day they're gone because they feel like it's somewhere else, but they don't know how things are moving. The same things with safe passage and safe routes are the ones. Nothing is coordinated at all. And for a person who used to be formerly military, kids exploit it. They they they're just smarter. And um and I, I don't mean to to create say well, kids yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, smarter, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but by age or anything like that. But I'm just saying, um, those who want to do something because they're so well coordinated with social media and things like that. They're just better at moving around and doing it. And I think what we need to start advocating for is someone who's going to coordinate efforts across different agencies, um, across both sectors, so that we actually know where, what capacity do we have, where can they be? Because let's talk about a place like NOMA. NOMA has Kinley, uh, Kip, Kip College Prep, and what else? Um, Zachary. We have three schools at McKinley and Dunbar that all come together all at the same time, basically within 20 minutes together. So you have all these students that come to NOMA at the same time, lots of confusion. Then we get calls from like Union Marcus saying these kids are hanging out with this, they're doing that, there's that. But there's no coordination. There's not even coordination between the schools, and those schools are in the same proximity and they all use the same metro stop. So there's no coordination between the Metro Police, MPD. The schools or anyone. We're just like, well, they're out of school. And then that's what's happening. Because yeah. we have lost a student at NOMA, got stabbed, got killed in the first year, 2018, when I first got right there in front of the station, going into the dial thing. Um, so this is that was like the second student that I know of, of KIP DC. Something happened. I say all that to say 
we need to start asking the city, how are they going to support this on a macro level so that we actually know at any particular time what type of resources do a school have? We don't know what to do when, as you said, which was one of my schools, a person decides to hold up and have a barricade and have a shootout with a cop across the street from a school and teachers that are arriving and students are arriving at the time that this person enters his home and decides to have a shootout across the street. So we contacted our teachers and our parents and told them what to do, but that's something that we could do, not every school, because you had two other schools that were in that particular area. You had Kelly Miller, yeah. and you also had Maya and, Lo and also Lisa Scott, which are a block away. All this happening together, we don't court make false opinions. So what I'm saying is that, as you said, uh, Dr. Green, on a macro level, someone has to say, this is how we're going to do things. And that means both from violence and from traffic, because those are the two areas when we're talking about safety that we're seeing the most problems. Either they're unsafe when they're traveling to and from school, or they're, they're when they congregate or coming from a sporting event where we're seeing all the incidents that we're having. It is very uncoordinated, it is unsafe, children having the um, things that they have, you know, social media wise, they're just a lot smarter and moving things around, you know? And even our students, and I'll leave it at this, we actually had violent interrupters this week, um, Zachary in, in Ward 5, where because growing up had the type of relationship that they had with uh, some of the people in the community, this guy actually walked up on a car and the guys had guns in their car. They were targeting some kids if they saw those kids, they were going to kill them. And they told the growing up people who they had a relationship with, if we see, and they named the students, if we see these students, we're going to kill them because they posted this up on social media. We did not like, and we are looking for them and we are hunting them. Those are the type of things that are happening that are real world happen. And there's no coordination. And that particular violent interrupter, because I had a relationship with, he was with Kip, we were able to de-escalate that particular event, bring NPD in, but what happens to the school that doesn't have that relationship? That's a dead shot. Is what that happens easy? if he's not there? Yeah, if he's not there, that's, that's, a, dead, that, that's a dead shot. He said he looked in the vehicle and they looked at arson was in that car. Mm. That's real. That's what our kids are facing. That's just real. And so we had to think about ways of getting those children that were targeted different routes home. We went into things like, can they do um, virtual learning for a little while till we get a safety plan in place? But that's not being coordinated across different schools, different sectors. So a lot of children are not safe. That's what I'm saying. Representative Chang. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. I, I actually have a series of questions for Dr. Patterson, if I may, as someone who has been working on this. Then that's fodder for us to think about what piece of this we can focus on as a board. What, what I'm hearing is, is coordination across what most people are saying and coordination around what to start. And I think it is, is, a, is a tactical question for me. So, so um, you, you named social media a few times, right? And it seems like that, seemed, that, that is often a spark for violence at least within schools, is that correct? And what, what have you seen is a successful way to catch that sooner rather than after the fact, tie it to the social, tie it back to social media? Is there any way to, you know, I, I would say we're not gonna have a sense of, you know, this violence is coming and we do something about the relationship or in advance in, in the case, that I just talked about yeah. at our school on, that happens on, 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 on the street. It was that this individual had a relationship with the individuals and also a relationship with parents. So I would say again, what we do to help schools also build those type of relationships would do that, that much more to, to help because parents do know some things. Um, and so when we were able to have those conversations with the parents and say, look, we're gonna keep your child safe. Um, there might be some days that they can't come to school. We need to work with us on this. Even if we're saying like you have to bring your child to school, or those type of things are arranged for transportation. It, having the relationship with the right people, whether it's providing brothers or with parents, to be proactive, and that takes a lot. I mentioned it very early on 
the person that we're about to hire. And the reason that we're going to hire that person is because of the pleasure of, of relationships that that person has. They've been in for five, they've been eight, they know parents, they've been around since piece of holics, and they know relationships. And so they get in front of a lot of the things that's happening. Um, and they have great relationships with parents They watch these kids grow up. But we need to have those type of things that can coordinate. And then he knows the right people to call. So he's mapped out how do you be proactive? And then also what's your crisis response if something does happen? That's his job and the job title to do those things. What we can do to be proactive and what you do if you have a crisis response. Who gets the contact who contact who? Who's in charge of those contacts? And, and a lot of that seems to be the work of a, I don't know if there's a standard process for violence interruption, but, but of the violence interruption, right? That, that seems to be a bad person. Would you say that that is the look, that is the thing that we should be advocating for to fund more widely, or just would for violence interrupters be the lowest hanging fruit for us to to solve some of these problems? I would say violent interrupters being actually to have one. Okay, so there's a difference of having violent interrupters that are kind of stated in and in, in areas are what I would say hot spots. There's another thing for violent interrupters to have a relationship with the school and school leaders to inform them about what needs to get done, that there's a big difference. So there's violent interrupters, but what they do is they deploy on corners that are hot spots and stuff like that. Then there are violent interrupters that have relationships with school leaders, and they can say, look, this particular school person is sending beef with somebody at Dunbar that also has a beef with somebody that's at McKinley. They all have to meet up at Dunbar. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things I'm I've been struggling with when my when I've gone on my school visits and I'm talking to my school leaders, is they're saying that the people who used to give them that information were their SROs. Mm-hmm. And our SROs got cut in half last year and are getting cut every year. I'm not saying that the answer has to be SROs, but I'm saying if we're going to take SROs down, we have to take increase the communication and somebody has to be because i know like i will i can tell you and it's not even just recently like i'll never forget we had someone who literally i don't know if the police were chasing them or what but they drove all the way down 49th street they literally hit three different schools because they were shooting they it was aton at the time aton's right there kelly miller drove all the way down to ron brown The, the people who told them like lockdown, don't let your kids outside, we're the SROs. And I don't know who's doing that now. Right. Like so, communicating. So, yeah, so, so Correct. Who who's saying like, this is like, there's stuff happening. What right. they tell you, or like, I, I'm not gonna say the school, but one of my schools, the high school students came down and jumped to middle school students and was turned into, a, and the, actually the safe passage workers intervenes uh, and actually de-escalated the situation, which was a good thing, but it bubbled back up later in the day. And I was, I was there, I saw it happen because the, the families are in the school together. Right. And we don't have anyone saying like, oh, hey, like this was happening or this happened this morning. Because the safe passage workers might know and they might tell the principal, but that doesn't mean that all the teachers who then should probably be on the lookout know. Like it literally is a Sometimes a communication issue to like maintain the like de escalate and then keep calm at times. And so, to your point, the violent interrupter was able to tell the SRO that uh, Kip still has SROs. And they were able to tell their sergeant, tell their command, and bring more resources. Tell their counselor at the time that's going to be in the future to call, down, call the counselor and say, look, this is what's happening. And we need you to, to talk to the commander. But it was because we had that meeting. Back in the day when I did work for DC government, we used to have hot spots and we were bring a particular area like was in Paris was having a lot of incidents. We would focus all resources. Every agency had to have it once a week meeting on how they were addressing the issue. People had court and, teams. And, and we, we coordinated all the services. We don't do anything like that to keep our kids safe where people are being on a regular basis saying, Okay, these are different agencies that have that our stakeholders to keep these children safe. So we got, you know, safe passage, we got safe street, we got the ones here, we got 
Let's share, share some information. Here are the streets. Let's let's share some information. Let's, let's share some intel. That does not happen is what I'm saying on the back of that. None of that coordination happens. Are people interacting with their like like I remember when um, and I don't even know who the person is now, but like when Judah Irving was our 60 outreach person, she wasn't an officer. She was a civilian who was responsible for doing like community engagement stuff. And she knew all the things. So it wasn't like you had a you had someone who had access to some police information, but was not there to police people um, as a connection point. Do we even still have that, like those types of rooms? No. I, not that I know of that where anybody is pulling together to people in certain communities that have had, you know, multiple incidents, so to speak, or know the different groups that have incidents or something against each other. We don't have anything like that that coordinates information. We just happen to be fortunate enough in Ward 5 to have a group like growing up that allows us to get information to keep our kids safe. And that's just one LEA. That's not happened across the public health. Yeah. You're saying this person was at MPD, but was not a, like a it's sworn it's officer. A it's a building. It's a building person whose job is like outreach mm-hmm. and then like connection with other agencies. Yeah. Can I actually, I so what I am starting to imagine is somebody or several people like that. And given the rise in violence that we're seeing, it seems like it's something that maybe it's worth asking for in the budget that's coming up, right? Um, not necessarily from us, but to make a recommendation to the DME that this is something that's needed. Maybe there is a role to be created at this point that is like the coordinator, communicator, first of all, to figure out what your different schools need around safety. Um, both in terms of traveling to from school, but also like within, you know, all of the things we're hearing. Uh, it seems like that that's a position that needs to be created to create cohesion, to create so that better, yeah. Um, yeah, it just makes sense. The, because the, that's something I've been hearing risk, even, yeah. The risk there to me is to create a, Administrator who is building relationships with admin, and I think what I hear Dr. Patterson saying, and I think this is really crucial of like if we're going to finish that role, is relationships with families, relationships with the community seem to be more important than relationships with other I'm, bureaucrats. No, that's you know? what I'm saying. Yeah. So I'm saying it's the DME's office that would fund it, but they would be coordinators. Or say a cluster, or you know, they'd have to figure out how to make it work. But they would be responsible for being the connectors between all of those different. Uh, yeah, I hear you. I hear you saying the the description Representative Chang is talking about, and you're offering which uh, which point we go to to say here's who can fund, and here's like here's the home for it. The home yeah. will be DME. For the for the people you're talking about, and then can I just say well, that's where safe passage operates out of. Um, to your point, yeah. um, Representative Chang, earlier or your question about the the social media, I think is a great question, and I'm just wondering to what extent are teachers aware that this is like a real issue, right? That like they need to be explicit. <laughs> you know, how we're teaching kids about social media and how serious it can be. I mean, I'm sure they're learning it, but we don't want them to learn it the hard way. And I don't know if that's something that sounds very like an old person saying it. Um, so I'm uh-huh. happy to hear. I'll, like, just, I'll just chime in and say that <laughs> for a resolution, for a ceremonial resolution, we're going to look at next week. I was looking through the DC health standards today. So in theory, it is part of the DC health standards. Yeah that our students are supposed to be taught about social media usage, about its implications both in physical violence and in dating violence, and the use of it. Whether it's happening is another question entirely, but like, as far as what the board could do, academic standards already exist on this topic, and whether they're instructed. What's that? And if it changes behaviors. Correct. Right. Yeah. I think the issue is a lot of times, videos from like 2005 that are not, representative of what it's like to be a student on social media or a student on social media in DC. 
because I think yeah. that the issues that we face are like very distinct. Like the way kids in Iowa are using it. Now I'm not from Iowa, so I wouldn't know. Obviously, but the way they're using it on Instagram, I think, is very different from the way that we're using it. And so it's hard to engage with this. One, the people in those videos are like. 12 year old white kids like these are not the student population of dc and it's just like cyberbullying is bad because it can make your friends sad but the extent to which like cyberbullying and like like dr crash the extent to which like conflicts on social media escalate is much more than like it could make your friends sad right like it is an actual physical threat and i think because we don't teach that it extends to that point it doesn't seem meaningful especially because we also just spent like two years on that and we didn't have a choice. We had to communicate digitally. So it's hard to create those boundaries because my school is online. So why is it okay for me to online Zoom with my teacher and type in the chat, but I can't text my friends on Instagram. So I think it's hard to build those boundaries back after we've just had years and years online when a lot of the resources we're being taught are like, like pretty old compared to where social media is now. Would the student advisory committee be willing to take this on as a topic or just ask what would what would a public safety solution look like in your We can ask them. Yeah. Is it the same so, way that you Well, is there a better not old people question? Yeah. We should be asking. <laughs> Don't be mindful. We're roughly at our ask anybody on the old people. <laughs> we're roughly at our 30 minutes. So I want to repeat back some of the things I heard. And I'll note that our staff has been taking notes and that we have a panel discussion this next week. So this is not the only conversation on this, this is the first. So I heard that there are questions around mapping who even exists to be doing this work across the agencies across the district. And along with that, mapping who does what. So in some ways, like an asset mapping of what already exists and who's doing what and where the gaps are. Also looking at who at individual schools or LEAs is doing coordination. So who has something like the position Dr. Patterson was talking about interviewing for versus who does not and whether there are models uh, that folks are trying to do this work at the school or LEA level. Things I heard that folks like focus on as problems. So the lack of coordination across different folks doing different work and how that work connects to communities, connects to schools. Uh, Dr. Patterson's very thoughtful point about young people being able to exploit gaps in the system uh, and, and the lack of coordination, making it easier for these sorts of dangerous episodes to escalate. Uh, the need for relationships with violence interrupters in schools, as well as with communities and not just with agencies that are funding them and paying uh, sort of their way. And then thinking about who is taking the place of sources of information if the SRO roll down continues and those folks were valuable sources of information. Uh, so I heard those things as, as key points that were raised and then sort of iterated on. This role of social media was the other big theme and thinking about that. Uh, so I'm hopeful that our staff can throw back to us some possible questions for panelists, for panelists, some questions that come out of this discussion. Um, I also think it would be really interesting to, to ask the panelists if they can talk to us about who exists and who does what so that we could start to maybe make a map of that work um and then our student advisory committee will be consulted on whether or not this is a topic of interest to them and we'll follow back up with them do you have any closing thoughts before we talk i have a question about the panelists i don't know who they are but i i have a qualm about experts who aren't real people they're expert, and I think that uh, I would like to hear from someone uh, who's involved in the District of Columbia's uh, problems rather than someone who's, I don't know who the people are, but it would be nice to have a young person as a panelist uh, or someone who's experienced in those kinds of things. We brainstormed last week some of the folks we're inviting. I don't know if Mr. Hugh has that listed all ready or remind us. I know we talked about maybe having someone from the one's office with a request, thinking about folks from LEAs. So we were not focused at all on national experts. Okay. We were very much focused on who locally could we even ask who might be willing to come and speak to us and help us get educated on this. We're not okay. inviting the person that we talked about in the social media. We're not inviting Yeah, we're not inviting the, 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 the white 12-year-olds from the social media videos. Or the people who made the videos. I'll be like, 
what we see is a lot of things like for sex ed the yeah. videos that i got for sex ed in freshman year were from like 1990 and this is 2019. They were that modern? They were actually in the So it's it's a 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 it's Possible to watch these kids and watch them interact with you. Yeah. Because okay, my school, they don't I have not had sex ed yet. And I mean um I'm a sophomore. Um they only the seniors I believe have sex ed, which I find so absolutely they that's that. yeah, that's and <laughs> when when they do like people, 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 people are exactly people are they're not <laughs> taking it seriously or they're laughing the entire time. <laughs> and it just it's a difficult. Okay, so we've also got what is this, what what does the standard say yeah. versus how implementation is being rolled out. Okay, so yeah, we asked for student voices, say Catholic representatives, maybe someone from uh, info from the ombudsman or the office of student advocate on what they're hearing on their. I'd like orders. to hear from the person that Dr. Patterson is interviewing for the job. <laughs> We are we also yes, well, we are to a <laughs> no, you guys might this is the hottest topic in town now. We also talked about inviting someone from Children's National, recognizing that violence for our young people is a public health issue and thinking about what you're seeing uh, at Children's National. Okay, I appreciate the time on that. I appreciate the public right. discussion. I am grateful for the expertise in this room and also desperately sad about the expertise that exists in this room. Uh, but we'll be we'll be more on this next week. Wait, sorry, can I say one more thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is something that actually my parents and I were talking about earlier, and I don't think it's specific to like this position or a position like it. But I think to your point of SROs, it's like in a lot of schools they've been there for a long time. So they were able to build relationships. Mm -hmm. And especially in high school, sometimes people will come in and they'll be like, I'm this position, I'm here to do this and this. But it's like I'm a senior. This is my fourth year at this school. I know this school and it's hard to connect with them because you know precisely why they're there. And so it can be hard to engage with them. So I think that's the hardest part is like building relationships with people who have relationships to the community, but also know how to address issues. So I think that's another issue that we face because it's hard to just build relationships with students, um, especially like as we get into like, when you're a freshman, it's a little bit easier because everyone's new. But if you're a senior, you've been with your peers for a while. And so coming into a new position like that, like the older you get, it's harder to engage with those things. So that's just another issue that I was thinking of that I'll come up. Yeah, I think that's right. Institutional memory and institutional presence. All right, we're gonna shift now into a couple of shorter discussions on debriefing. So last month at our public meeting, we had a panel of ESSER experts uh, and we asked folks to speak with us about how ESSER dollars are being deployed what we should be thinking about. And as a reminder, we heard from Chad Alderman at the Edgenomics Lab at Georgetown, Kelsey Coffin from the DC Policy Center, Dr. Lynn Jennings, the Senior Director of National and State Partnerships at the Ed Trust, and Jonathan Travers, Managing Partner from Education Resource Strategies. Just wanted to see and open up the floor for roughly 20 minutes to see if folks had observations uh, about what we heard or any questions that we want to follow up on or things that you are thinking about that we should focus on here in DC based on what was shared with us from the experts. Uh, Representative Bernstein and then Dr. Patterson. Um, this wasn't technically part of the panel, but I posed a question to Stacey Boyd, who came and spoke in like separate testimony about like if libraries and librarians were seeing this as their funding. I know the problem is you can't use it to create a new salary position, right? Because it expires. So I was thinking, okay, then we should be able to create our sorts of things in our libraries and other things. But it seems like, at least from what Ms. Boyd said, that's not actually a thing that is happening. But it seems like this is what we, this is a very, potentially a very good use of this money because if you don't tie it to a salary role, it can still exist and we can buy like materials. So I don't know what we need to do with that, but that was just something that really stuck out to me from the discussion at the point. Yeah, it's a great point. And actually, Casey emailed. Representative Chang and I, and so I was, I went looking through uh, the ESSER fund so far. So a couple just observations to share with colleagues on this, and then to figure out what else we might wanna ask about or think about. 
So in DC state plans submitted to the US Department of Ed, there's no mention of libraries, librarians, books, period. There's talk about resources and academic resources, instructional resources, instructional materials, but there's no like, key, I, I keyword searched a bunch of things in the document. There's nothing on libraries, librarians, and books. Uh, in the DCPS plan, because Ms. Boyd asked specifically about DCPS, in their continuous education plan that was submitted to OSI, including their plans to spend the ESSER three dollars, there's no mention of libraries or books, but they talk about professional development for librarians around the use of educational technology and additional instructional resources. So there is money in DCPS's plans for professional development for librarians. Um, I did not search all the charter LEAs, so I can't speak to that. But the thing that I think stuck out to me is that in Aussie's chart on their dashboard of how they're spending money, they have a downloadable Excel file where you can actually look at the categories folks are reporting. And while they have a category for instructional materials and supplies, there is no category that asks about books, libraries, librarians, et cetera. So I think one thing I said back to Ms. Boyd is that it would be a question we could pose to Aussie, but it might not be easy for them to immediately answer because they're not collecting the data in that way. And so it would be something that we'd have to pose to DCPS directly. DCPS would know if they spent money on libraries or librarians. Every individual charter LEA would know, but it's not something that OSI has collected in that format. So one thing that comes to me out of that is, could we ask for some additional details in categories of spending? And could it be done on an annual basis or could it be done at the end of each of the grant cycles? So could OSI publish some sort of like report that's illustrative of what LEA spent it on? I don't know if folks have other ideas, but I like to nerd out on publicly available data. So that's what I got in my little trip down the rabbit hole. And can I just clarify? I, so ESSER is expiring, but, but schools can still spend money on professional developments now that they're going to use past the expiration date as long as they spend the money before it expires, right? That's right. And I don't think the ESSER money expires until the end of FY24, and then there's like no, the cost like extensions. Yeah, yeah it's, well, there's three, there's technically three tranches of funding. So there's this, this rolling loop. I'll, I'll think of it as rolling, but there's three tranches of funding. And there's a difference between like when you have to have purchased something and when you have to have a service provider. Um, there is also a question as far as the, if the Department of Ed will allow extension um, to, to both of those things. So, you can, let's say, sticking with the professional development videos or whatever, but for teachers, let's say they actually did purchase um, some type of video training. That's a forever thing. It doesn't matter if they implement it during the time. So, okay. Just want to check that. Dr. So, you guys answered my first part of my question about really getting stuff to understand who has obligated how that work, their answer funding per cycle, because we know basically there's three cycles when it ended. And so we really want to understand if they've obligated those funds to be spent and how much, and if they're actually using them, we actually just saw something in housing and now that there will, something's not being used up to its amount. So we're losing those federal dollars. Um, that's a, a major problem. Who has oversight and who's calling for that oversight? The second part of that is that every LEA that I have engaged since you had the, the, the panel, they have no plan for when ESSER funds go away. And I listen very distinctly to gentlemen talk about there people have ramped up in you know certain parts, FTEs and staffing and certain supplies. So 2024, this goes away and you live three years on this nice bigger budget, but you have no plan whatsoever of when that money goes away or what are you going to do with those particular uh, FTEs, that type of, of just having that money to buy those particular supplies. And that's worrisome to me because everybody's like, okay, we're fat and happy right now, but basically half of your household money is about to go away in two years. So what are your plans? It's like nobody, they're just like, we're just going to ignore it for right now. And that concerns me because I'm literally talking to, to, to LEA and one. So when extra funds go away in 2024, what are you going to do? And they just look at me with a blank face. <laughs> and I'm like, Wow, really? That's what we're doing. So that concerns me. If there's a plan, how that's going to be done, who's talking to who? Um, we don't control people's budgets, but it's going to be a big impact um, for 
every single LEA in the city when those cancer funds go away and they have and they have used them for everything. Dr. Larry. I was trying to figure out what ESSER was when I looked at this on the, on the <laughs> because I'm I'm not I'm not into acronyms and all this other, but now I really remember the testimony and I remember the chart where some of the LEAs had spent all their money. Some had spent up to 40%. Yeah, and even more than that even, particular time. Even more than that. And they weren't and they weren't going to have any money left. And there was no kind of, and I don't, who's controlling? That might go back to what we were talking about, about uh, the, uh, each LEA has its own uh, community service kind of thing. We have to have some kind of coordination in a city that's one person in charge of education and, and have some kind of coordination so that because schools are, I mean, there are schools that are like you're talking about feeling fat in the first year of my budget. And then I'm sitting there kiting checks in the second year of my budget. And then I'm robbing a bank or something for the third year of the budget. <laughs> and, and and that's what the, that's what that chart looks like. I've, I've done none of those things. But that's what that chart looked like. That chart was horrific looking at it about how this, how they could be so independent with their ignorance. Well, Vice President Thompson? Well, I mean, part of it is just like the way, the way ESSER is structured, there is a lot of independence. And there are very few guardrails from the Department of Ed on what you can use the funding for. So, and like I remember when the first tranche of ESSER funding hit, uh, and what Representative Bird said was talking about when uh, DCPS schools got guidance on their LSATs not to spend for a position. That was DCPS's choice. That wasn't something that the ESSER regulations said were true. But the reason DCPS did that uh, was because they knew that that money was going away. And so they didn't want to fund positions to then, that would then disappear. Right. And they weren't going to get, which, which but there was a lot of heartache around that because there were also other cuts and other issues. So, too. yeah, it was, a, it was a lot going on. That being said, there are, there literally are very few barriers around mass spending. What I heard, I don't know, I think somebody, I remember writing it down, but I heard somebody at Austin say, maybe Dr. Moran, uh, was that they are hiring, it was in one of the working sessions, it's like a, they said something about like a czar type of position uh, to look across the ESSER spending. Because what's been true uh, nationally is that we just don't have a lot of uh, insight around how people are spending the money, like really like bright spots, can't even be best because it's not that long, but like promising practices and like how we should be guiding people to say, hey, this is really working. So what a lot of times you hear people talk about is like, oh, well, was proven is like high impact tutoring, so people default to that for like learning acceleration, and that's not all created equal. And also, and I also would imagine it doesn't address all the things that people have experienced in the pandemic uh, and need supports around coming out. Of it. And so it's just it, it is both a it is very independent how you use funding, and because it's so independent, it's hard to cross and say here's what people are doing that do it in like a smart way. So I, I do think it would be a good idea for us to find out more about, and, oh, and the other thing I was saying, technically there are other parts of government that touch students who also have uh, rescue, rescue funds. And, we, and so the ESSER is one bunch, but like those, the ARPA and everything else, like and those things too, like when we talk about like the mental health supports and other things, we don't have a bunch of insight into that either. Um, and Dr. Patterson's right. It is all going to go away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So be mindful of all these big questions that I think we all have on like the, the reasonable use and the effective use of these federal funds in our schools and across the districts. There are a couple wonderings I have. Like I would love to ask for this information and I would love for this information to have a public forum. I think we can ask Ozzy for some of this information to get. I think we could put ideas in the heads of our council members 
to hold a public hearing on the use of federal rescue funds, uh, both from the education cluster and from other government agencies to ask them to report out on the current status of spending. And we could go participate by suggesting questions uh, that could be asked there. Uh, but I'd like to ask you all, like, what do you think we should do? Because what I don't want to do is I've had this panel and then say, well, thanks for sharing. Well, at least with the panel, we'll get what well, we got information. Was it good? Information. It wasn't positive. Yes. I don't think good. But, it was educational. Uh, but there has to be education good. <laughs> so uh, well, we, we, we have to follow up. I really like the idea of uh, the council hearing because uh, the word's got to get out. Because the last thing that people want to do is wake up in the morning with no money. Say, what happened to our money? And to what we have some time now to basically say, what, where are we today? How much time do we have left yeah. to improve the way things are going? All right. Um, if folks have other ideas on other ways we can take action, but I, I like this idea of maybe nudging council towards holding hearing as well as asking Ozzy for more granular data um, around the way the folks are spending the money. I think Dr. Patterson's question around the obligation is key because Ozzy has all that. They know what, what folks have obligated versus what they've liquidated. Right. And the um, information didn't come out of nowhere. I, while you were, I was laughing. I wasn't laughing at you, President Sir. I was thinking of Abbott Elementary. I hope that everyone watches Abbott Elementary. I, say, you I would be worried. Okay. But last, in the last cycle of Abbott Elementary, the principal got some money. Yes. And she asked everybody for how can we spend the Shark Tank pitches. Right? Yes. And then she decided to spend it all with you. <laughs> And that, and that just reminds me of that whole thing that we learned at the ESSER panel. Yeah. Wow, a whole bunch of money. Well, I hope there's not a new sign coming for any of these schools. No. I mean, well, the, the last thing that I remember Dr. Jones was sharing, which I'm, I'm going to talk about for, uh, is I know ESSER is kind of put these materials together around for like parents, community members, yeah, on questions they can't ask, yeah, uh, to better educate themselves. Yeah, I appreciate that. And that's something we can uh, share as a follow-up once this is completed. Excellent. All right, so we have two sort of asks. One, we're going to follow up with Ossie on some more data uh, and then perhaps start thinking about how to nudge council for requesting and hearing on this. So one last debrief uh, over for just roughly 15 minutes, then we'll move to committee reports and new business. I want to talk about the State Board's Back to School Engagement event because I appreciate that everyone took the time to come out. We had over 60 community members, as I noted in the top of the meeting. And we had such robust and thoughtful discussion in the rooms and the sessions. And shout out to our student representatives and to the other students who attended. I got to be present for some really thoughtful conversations with students. And I will say they elevated the level of discussion in each of the rooms that they were in. Uh, one attendee emailed the State Board office and they shared the following. This is an overdue thank you to SBOE for organizing such an informative and interesting event. I learned a great deal about navigating the system from a parent perspective, and I was able to connect with a few folks from SBOE to engage in meaningful conversations. I just wish I knew about these agencies and resources earlier after almost 10 years as a parent in DC. Wow. So thank you to everyone who took time to plan this, who came out to be part of it, and who made this event the success that it was. This work that we're trying to do uh, to reach community members and to make them feel invested and educated about the system is clearly working. So uh, folks who are here, if you would share one thing you liked about the retreat, the, I'm sorry, the uh, engagement session, and one thing you'd like to see us change for the next time we do this, that would be great. And I think it would help our staff to start keeping that information for planning future events. Do you want to get started? Yeah, I was, I don't know why I was just writing this somewhere, but um, too short. The sessions were much too short. And with this particular one, I think they're always gonna be slightly different. Um, this one, we had three sessions because that was feedback we got from the first one, I know. Um, but I felt like we could have really done with two sessions that were longer. And if I were to err on the side of 
like having people leaving wanting more, but having really been able to like dive in more. And I don't know if every session felt like that, but I will say that especially for uh, the accountability and assessment, it just felt really rushed. And so that's one. Um, what I liked, I would say, is just it was much more um, diverse in terms of the, I was thinking it would be mostly parents, uh, but there were a lot of different kinds of folks there, or just folks from different backgrounds, you know, so different kinds of parents, too, for sure. Um, and did we, I thought we were going to have childcare. That was something. Did we have childcare? So there were some fam kids, there were at least one parent um, duo who were like going around with their kids and it was hard for them, I felt like to, so I wasn't sure, but that was not on us. That was their decision. I mean, just to clarify, so there was, they were in the gym and um, they were along with the and I actually do think that that family question when gathered and the kids were playing with the, the child care folks that maybe traveled back with their parents. Maybe they yeah. wanted to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 But there was. Um, okay. But I think they're probably wasting time. Yeah. So, okay. Here. So, other positives and deltas, things we should change or consider for the future, Dr. Lear? I think that uh, I, I've mentioned this afterwards is that. I know that there were hardly there was hardly anyone from uh, the other side of the city, our side of the city of the pool. Uh, that we got, I, I think that maybe in the future, we talk about in the future, that if we're going to do it, it might be a good idea to have two. One maybe west of North Capitol Street, or maybe east of North Capitol Street. At the same time, uh, and maybe have be hard representatives, <laughs> huh? It'd be hard for a staff. Well, well, or it, a different all, you, all you have to yeah. do is separate it by those wards. But why does it have to be the same day? It could be different days, but like, well, you could go north, south. I don't, it's just that yeah. I know that having, having ones that serve different regions of the city, yeah. Important. And yeah. like, if we for had sure. one in Roosevelt. Then, then it would be it's near the metro, just like just like Eastern is, but it's also much more accessible to parents that live in the in the area, because I doubt if we had too many people that came across town, even though Eastern's not, I mean it's not across town, but it's, it's mental. but it's still, you know, you have to take the, you can't you don't have a car. Uh, I just think that it might, it might be something to think about. I thought it was a very valuable occurrence. Yeah. But I think that but, but it was also a low population of people that benefited from it. We need to want, want to make sure that we benefit as many people. Because, like you said, people don't know who we are, so they don't know what the state board does. And they and they learned a lot yeah. in the two or three hours. No, I, I think that's a good a good suggestion. What'd you like, Dr. Larry? Say so, again. Yeah. What did you like? <laughs> I just I, I just said it was okay. It was a good event. All right. I, I like I like the, the vegan sandwich. The vegan sandwich. <laughs> Representative Park there. I thought the content was strong. Uh, obviously, I only had the vantage point of one session, but I trust that the content in the other rooms were strong. For what I saw, I agree. I also thought it was really cool to have vendors there. So, for instance, like the YMC A partners, uh, just provided outlet, and I learned something. I, to O'Leary's point, I think as much as we provide a primer for folks, I felt like in the parent engagement, we spent a few minutes having to kind of prime people like, this is what the state board is. This is when we talk about this, this is why we're talking about it. Um, and I think just operating from a place of assuming people don't know what the board is and what we do, uh, especially for the parents that that seemed like maybe that was their first time engaging. And that could have been a helpful primer, I think, as an intro before people go off. Thank you, Representative Parker. Vice President Thompson. 
Um, I think I think the following. I think we learned, uh, or maybe we kind of already knew. Uh, it's really hard to find a school uh, that is central to the city uh, and is both parking accessible and metro accessible. But we tried really hard. Yeah, but that's really hard to do. Um, and we ended up with the one day, but I do think in the future only like two, like and we have one day for a whole bunch of different, like you know, we talk about a lot of things together. But uh in the future, I do think it's important just to have two, just based on the way our city set up and all the things. Um not on the same day at the same time though, because uh that's crazy. Well, <laughs> we just don't have the class enough, right? But we could but that's all it just that yeah. that just happened. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a different day. But we should, we should, we, I, I think you're right about that. I do, um, I do also just wonder, um, I, I, I would lean towards like the working lunch in general as a logistic thing. Because um, people go. Like it feel, it's hard, it's hard to like re corral people on a Sunday. I mean, on a Saturday, all the things. So I think a working lunch could be, the, especially because so many of them are session based. Mm -hmm. Why not? Like, why not? Um, hmm. I don't. Um, I, I think the one thing that we can't seem to completely control for, which I do wonder how it affected uh, just attendance, is like how much information we get from a school as far as like what else is happening <laughs> on the day. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how to, because we 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 weren't we did not know nope. all of those things, were, and it was and I know it was super confusing for like attendees or like just like no one was sure to go in, like were you in the right place at the right event, yeah. right? Like is there we're thinking there's going to be parking, there is no such thing, uh, like all all the things. So I don't I don't know how to better control for that. Um, and, and, and maybe the answer is that we lean away from schools into other, yeah. like rec centers, libraries, like I'm that type I'm of okay thing. With um, yeah, so maybe, so maybe that's a lesson learned because that, that was, that was a lot to navigate. Um, yes. And, and I don't think like just more signage would have fixed it or like, it might have helped, but that was something outside of our control that we might want to guard against having outside of our control. That's a good point. Representative Chang, did I see your hand? This is a, I, I, I had a good time tonight. I think I was able to get deep in, in conversation with, with families that I had not previously. But this is a challenge for all of us. I would, and you know, I would love to see us instead of asking people to come to us for the next one, just go to where people are. So whether that's like, do do a convening at a farmer's market, do a convening at the football game, after, before, right? Like do it around an event where we know hundreds of people, thousands of people will already be there instead of spending a lot of time inviting people to change their schedule to come to us on Sunday and look for child care. What can we do to do pieces of this work where people are already going would make me feel yeah. really inspired about the work. It's a good, it's a good point and a good question. I think brainstorming some opportunities for that for the future is helpful. I would second that. And it's something I kind of learned during the pandemic when I was thinking about how do you get people to get vaccinated? And it was sort of figuring out like events to just latch onto that are already happening and people are already lining up or people are already, you know, in Columbia Heights coming back from school or people. So I like that idea a lot, actually. I think it's, you know, I think we could do both because um, it it gets to different people. I will say another thing I noted was there were interpreters there. So yay for us that there were no Spanish speaking families. So I, I, you know, I and then part of it is where it was, I think maybe, I don't know. And I feel bad that, you know, we didn't have that. Um, I think the other part was that we seem to have a lot more RSVPs than we had attendees. And so, so we were preparing for the folks that we thought. Oh, so, so people have signed up. Or someone, yeah, someone had requested translation yeah. services. So we, That's a, I went yeah. to here and reached out for the language. They did not respond. So we 
Insurance. Yeah. yeah. And then we make sure that we're covered in case they. I'm glad up, that right? we did. I mean, that's um, our responsibility, but I just, I guess it's more on us and I take part in responsibility for that, that like we, you know, uh, yeah, I wish there were more families from who represented that group. And then also, one thing we did do at the last round last year was feedback from the attendees and we didn't do that this time right we did oh we did yeah as i understand right we sent out an email thank you we, oh. say, we thank them if you are correct representatives but last time we actually sent out um, we more sent a form. Okay. we did not send a form this time um and i think there were hard copies at the tables if there was time people did it right there i don't i don't no? think so last time no because oh. the google form was created after the okay. fact but it was something that was not done. I think we could, that same thing, you know, send out a quick link again and ask them to. Obviously, it's now. It's true. No, I think it's a good, good but yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's a good, a good, it's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thought. Yeah. It, it might actually be helpful. Because, uh, like, I clearly, I was in my session, I only my session because I was a facilitator. It's, it is helpful to see how people rated other sessions. Um, we should know that and we should give people feedback. And I do wonder if we can like actually like record the sessions or something, uh, just in case we wanted to like we put them on our YouTube channel uh, or something for people who couldn't attend. Yeah. Um, and maybe all the sessions don't lend themselves to that, but at least it gives people a, a, a sense of like what was discussed. Uh, or might find people to get feedback who weren't there. Um, I yeah, I wonder if that's something we can do for the future. Yeah, I like these ideas. I mean, I think one thing I'm hearing from from everyone. So one thing that I liked very much about this was that um, we all came together and we we pulled this off at a time when we are down multiple staff members. Um, so like it was a really wonderful event, but I know it was it wow. took a lot of capacity. From our staff. So I think one improvement I have is that um, come the FY24 budget cycle, all the members who are still here advocate strongly to the council that we get a community engagement person so that our, our agency can come up another staff member um, and really have the, the ability to do all these great ideas. Because I think too, like when you talk about recording the sessions, I think that's a great idea. I also think it would be really helpful for committees to have when they do their work plan for the year like a quick little bullet of information that could be even like on a rapid uh, Instagram reel. Like the state board has five committees and these are the priorities they're working on this year. And here's 30 seconds from that chair and 30 seconds from that chair. But all of those, oh, six seconds? Six, six seconds from that chair. Six committees. Six committees, thank you. Uh, that we make sure that those committees all get to put their info out there. But all of these things are, are things that will work better when we have full staff capacity. Yes, and thank you, Representative Brinstead, for that. Mr. Right, Fleischer, Dr. Fleischer. Thank you. Uh, Morelli and I plan uh, out to spend the learning of eight weeks. So, like, can you yeah. share these out a little bit? I've been with Alistair. A lot of these organizations had, like, leads of these organizations don't even know who the state board is, but we had to explain it to them and, like, to share these flyers with them. So that might be another advocacy route. To put us on the radar of not just their thinking of organizations. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good point. Organizations that are serving immigrant communities that speak lots of different languages in the city. Last, last point on this, because I think that the, the connection to community autism is a really is a really powerful one, is just to start next year by asking what is the question that parents are trying to answer and frame the conference around that rather than as it gets to the state board because no one is walking around asking who is the state board. Conference that is trying to answer that, but if it is a you know public safety is a humongous issue for families right now. If it is a if it is a if it is a convening focused on hey the state board is going to talk to you about options to get feedback on this particular issue that you are asking your your friends and families all the time right now and it's it's a way for them to then get to know us i think that's another way i would just say yes and 
it's also an opportunity to share what we are actually working on because I think there's things that families don't realize impact them. Like they don't feel it directly, but it does matter. You know, so I think I think both are important. And and but centering that obviously making family. I appreciate I appreciate that idea. I also think that's a way we can leverage our partnerships with our sister agencies. Like what are the hot calls coming into the office now? That's what, what is the top topic coming into the student advocate's office? Could that be uh, at least a part of the engagement? Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for weighing in on that. Thank you for the feedback. I appreciate the call out that we, we need to make sure we evaluate how the public experiences are gatherings. We're going to move now to committee reports. Um, just as a flag for folks, you have in your folders the committee reports. So all the committee's notes are in there. Each committee uh, chair or the chairs or their representative who is being designated to, to do the report out will have no more than two minutes to quickly report. We'll have two minutes for questions after that. Uh, if you take a look at the printed committee reports in your folders, which are also on assembly and on uh, Dropbox for folks who are in the public, um, you all have that information. We're going to start, as we always do, with our students. Hi. So um, our student advisory committee has met one so far in person last month, September 22nd. Um, we had a super packed agenda. Um, we gave an overview of the SAC, um, our back to school events, which is discussed. Um, we gave a notification of accepted, accepted content proposals um, and had open dialogue about what we would like to accomplish this year and um, the community's uh, service hours and how we believe Austin should proceed. Um, our next meeting will be October the 17th. Uh, we will be reviewing a few different resolutions and we'll move forward with the work. Awesome. Thank you so much, Representative Washington. Are there questions for Representative Washington about the Student Advisory Committee report? Um, Excellent. Thank you. We'll move on then to accountability and assessment. Thank you. Um, I will just comment on some of the highlights that Darren um, put in our, our overview. So thank you, Darren. Um, so just um, on the meeting with Asi, um, to clarify sort of what our, how we are going to present to the public to make it clear that we are working together on the, um, the revision of both the formula, which is now at DOE, and the report card. Um, we, I think, landed in a good place to think about it in terms of coordination. Um, and this, was helpful also like when we presented at the um, engagement session, we are really presenting our recommendations and making it really clear to the public that this is what we, the state board has recommended to ASI and this is the same thing that ASI is, will be, ASI will be presenting and um, getting community feedback on the same topic. So that's something that we have heard from the public is confusing um, and that the public should expect that the state board's recommend, recommendations would be part of Aussie's presentation, basically. Um, so thank you to President Sutter for interfacing with uh, Aussie on that. Um, in terms of going forward, our committee will talk about what and if we're going to be doing more engagement um, around the report card um, and beyond that we are also figuring out a timeline for the, the well-rounded education work that we're going to be doing um, and hopefully engaging a third-party vendor for that research and then also we are discussing alternatives to park testing really as sort of at this point just possible recommendations we might make to Aussie. This is something we understand would be a long-term, you know, goal for them. Um, so it's not something we're expecting to happen overnight, but um, I think that's it for us. Thank you, Dr. Desoy. Yeah, questions for Dr. Desoy. All right. I have, I have a small question. Yeah, Dr. Leary. Do we know anything about what's going on with uh, the statewide assessments. 
Does anybody know anything? What do you mean? The chart about what they're going to, what's going to happen in the, in May? They're being given, right? Okay, but well what, what, what is they? Oh, it is crowd changes. Yeah. It's part at huh? this point, as far as I understand. Right? So there had been an a, an RFP or a solicitation of some sort. I don't know which, like the official type of solicitation, but there's a solicitation put out by Opti for a multi-year assessment contract. I am unaware of whether it has been granted, like whether they've issued it, um, a contract, and whether it was slated to start in school year 22-23 or 23-24. My hunch is that it would start in 23-24 because educators would have to be trained on it. You'd have to have folks right. trained on test security, et cetera. And I think that would be hard to do by April of this year. But I am happy to put this on uh, our docket for conversation with the state superintendent on Monday. And we can pose that question and then hopefully and the we'll back. Mayor, right? We do, but the deputy mayor probably won't know anything about the assessment contract. My question yes. is, are there, and I'm I'm asking out of ignorance for this. Are there, what are the what are the students working on as far as preparing for a assessment? Or are they? Are you hearing anything? Is anyone hearing anything from your your schools about the same pressure that students had over the past five years with the Clark test and they had to prepare all the time for the Test? Not at this point in the year, though. Yeah. Are you hearing anything? Else? Our schools don't prep for tests. <laughs> what? Is Isn't it a different board now? <laughs> no, I have not heard. But um, my guess is they're preparing like they normally do. Well, I, that's what I'm, you know, if they're preparing like they normally do, then that means they're working on getting ready for the park test. That usually is after January. Oh, come on. Oh, I mean, I, I normally don't hear about it in October. Yeah, I mean, I've never heard about it. Also, at the high school level, they just took the SATs. I know a lot of schools have been prepping for the SATs. Oh, I, noticed, I know that that, you know, that wasn't what was happening at the Yeah, I haven't heard anything yet, but we will ask on Monday okay. um, and see what we can find out. All right, let's move on to the admin. Admin Thompson. Admin just met today. Um, so Literally today. Literally this morning. Uh, because we are off of our regular schedule. Been a long day. It's been a long day. So we don't have a turn out yet. Um, but I'm happy to read my notes uh, from the admin. All right. So we got our usual reports from the Office of the Ombudsman and the Student Advocate. Um, they are both preparing for their annual presentations. Uh, this will happen uh, at our November working session. Uh, they're also, you know, doing their own annual performance reviews for their staff. Uh, Serena did update us about a rough uh, timeline for the DGF construction. As of right now, it looks like design beginning in mid-November, uh, construction uh, starting in January. Fingers crossed, end of August, everything is completed. Uh, I want to be very clear that this is a rough project of our existing space, not can't win them all. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Dan who shared a little bit about how we have now, how we now have this lovely new website that is also causing us problems uh, as far as just like being able to update uh, as mm -hmm. easily as we used to. So uh, we might be sending this on the, uh, on just getting that, you know, more consistently situated. Uh, Jeff already shared or sorry, Representative Sutter already shared share in our in her report that we made an offer to a lead candidate um, and that we also are actively hiring for the education standards position. We've got a great response. Um, so looking forward to having both of those positions filled very soon. Uh, and then we just talked about uh, the evals for the EV role, just getting some background on how that's happened in previous years, uh, which is really helpful. Uh, we did, uh, Alex, uh, our current interim EV confirmed that uh, the change we made to increase our fellows pay is now in effect. Uh, so they are now uh, at a rate of $20 per hour, which is uh, great because why belabor that? Uh, so thank you uh, for all the work that went into that. Uh, and then uh, Alex actually already shared 
uh, about the how we received the mayor's mark. Was this today or yesterday? When we received it, yeah, we received it Friday. Friday. Before the long Friday. <laughs> I did not have my notes when we received it, um, but that we received it Friday. <laughs> of course, that's when we received it Friday. Um, most practical time. Well, yeah. I mean, I've been ever working, working, working. You're like, I'm getting this out before I go on my own. Um, so we received it Friday. Uh, the opposite that headlines are um, no reduction overall, um, but it is not necessarily reflective of our still not necessarily reflective of our general personnel and non personnel costs to get to what we need for 23 and 24. So we're going to work on that. Uh, we've had a robust conversation around if we need it, you can go through the mark process in the first place, um, but we always do. Uh, and we will, for the foreseeable future, continue to do that. Um, and we also flag for our sale, given this effort to spend it, uh, that we actually do have a couple of uh, ARPA funded positions. And uh, on the ombudsman and student advocate staff, their salaries are also not funded in that amount. So we're going to have to watch that. It's just like everybody else. We have to pay attention to where our allotments are coming from. Uh, so that is. My report out from our meeting this morning. Are there any questions? Because I know it's not in front of you. Thank you, Representative Parker. I have a question. It was more about the specifics. So it does seem like there were reductions, so we will need to find money. So when I say no reductions, it's an allocable of what, what? No reductions, as in the overall number uh, from the mayor's office has not been reduced. However, after the mayor announced her budget, she did two things. So one, there are COLA increases uh, that were not accounted for. So if the number didn't go up, technically that is a reduction in our spending power, but it's not a reduction in our overall number, which is why it still doesn't meet uh, our uh, needs. Two, we have those ARPA positions and we did not get additional money for the ARPA positions. And we will still have to go through the process for advocating for the enhancement because the enhancements were not included. Uh, Serena did share that uh, this actually is, of course, to some extent typical, um, but there have been years where we actually did have overall number of reductions. Um, and so we're fighting more of an uphill battle. Um, so that's not true this year, but it literally is no reductions in the overall amount. And then the other question, we may not have this, was just about research funds. So for the last few years, we fought for that, which is more of an enhancement that we've gotten, as I understand, from the council, uh, certain council's offices. And I imagine at some point you will tell us what we should be asking our council members for in terms of those enhancements. We did not specifically put an enhancement in for research this right. year because we looked at the Roughly hundred thousand dollars in one budget line item, and the roughly twenty or thirty in another budget line item, and determined that both of those, like contractual and for uh, professional services lines, would be sufficient for the kinds of research work the board has done in the past. We did put in enhancements for this community service, the community outreach person, to be a new FTD added to the staff. We also put in enhancements to request increase in the scholarship opportunity for our student representatives uh, in alignment and keeping with the conversation we had with Ozzy earlier, which would not be treated as compensation, but which instead would be an academic scholarship for educational costs uh, and thus not connected to community service. There were a few other things, but we, did, we decided against that uh, as a call out line item and rather putting it in a permanent budget of the capacity Just to make sure I'm tracking the last point, those enhancements we still need to push for it, make sure we're for all the reasons. So there still will be a need for members to advocate for more money from council. Got it. Yeah, I would also add that uh, clearly because it's what Wednesday, uh, the email came through late on a Friday. Uh, Alex is, uh, has already reached out uh, to the mayor's office and has actually called tomorrow to go through like literally. So we know what the brass texts are of what is presented to us. Um, so there may be other things that uh, are flagged later, um, but this is this is our these are the highlights for now. Just just one point of 
clarification to something that Vice President Thompson said. Yeah, thank you. So when Vice President Thompson is saying that there were no reduction for, for FY24 in March, that is over FY23 essentially. Okay. So like basically the state board, as I'm understanding it, receiving essentially the same amount of money for FY24 as we did for FY23. There is a small increase, which which Vice President Thompson noticed, noted due to some of the mayoral polling increases, but that's the extent of it. It is not representative. Thompson said account for those other fractional increases that we had hoped in our FY20 budget. But hopefully I'll learn more tomorrow. Okay, I'll just gonna insert that one thing for folks to understand about the COLA, because this blows my mind. But it is the way our district government budget works. So our FY23 budget was passed in June of 2022. The mayor then announced cost of living adjustments that staff were denied during the pandemic and are now sort of catching up. Those cost of living adjustments, 1.5%, which has already hit folks, pay cycles, and 2.5%, which is yet to come, is not included in our budget. Our budget did not expand. So that 1.5% increase and the coming 2.5% increase must be absorbed by the agency from an existing budget. So just keep that in mind for folks as we, uh, as, as members who are returning next year, will stay on and listen to budget conversations about reprogramming of funds for non-personal services, to personal services that we love our staff and they work very hard and they deserve all this money, but the government did not set up a system that allows us to expand our budget in order to meet those salary adjustments. So that's for that's for FY23. For FY23. So yeah. folks are going to get paid more in FY23 to catch up for times that did not get cost of living adjustments in the past, but our budget didn't get any bigger as we were asked to spend more money on salaries. Is there any way we could uh, get that money? My understanding is no. And my understanding is no, too. So yeah. And I think, and this is something that Dan and Serena and I have talked about. As a smaller agency, to absorb that cost is much more difficult. Correct. Versus if you're, oh, sure. you know, correct. Uh, so just keeping that in mind that this is a discussion that will likely be ongoing for the board and that that's where that pressure will come from. Okay. That's charity measures, as it were. That concludes my report. <laughs> Board governance. Okay. You do have the board governance report in front of you because we did not read this morning. Uh, we met a few days ago. Uh, so that is helpful. Uh, a few things are uh, probably true. I'm, I'm not going to read the report you have in front of you. Uh, we did participate in the ball engagement session. Uh, thank you to uh, our staff. Thank you to uh, Caitlin for putting together uh, the, the slides that we used yet again. Uh, I'm sure if we had ratings, it would have been higher. So I don't know, but um, <laughs> thank you, Caitlin, for being awesome. Uh, and thank you for Darren. Uh, Darren and um, I'm not going to say it's too late in the too late in the day. Our policy fellow for helping to get us to a place of takeaway. Uh, what we essentially did was take all of the take the takeaways from the survey uh, and the focus groups. Uh, and that's what we use to uh, get more feedback on the presentation. Um, we are, we had a whole discussion around what to do with that, how we get from where we are, all the information we have now uh, to recommendations. Uh, we purposefully did not call the takeaways uh, recommendations because they have not been approved by the full board. And we did want, we did not want to confuse people. They're used to hearing recommendations from the state board. Uh, so uh, as members of the committee, um, we have a little bit more engagement to do uh, because we have not heard from enough people uh, and we need to hear from people, more people specifically in five, seven, and eight. Uh, so we are going on a little bit of what I'm calling engagement lights. Uh, we had a discussion around how to do that. Uh, that will largely be taken on by the committee members. Uh, but if there are other representatives uh, who would like to who will participate in the engagement light as well, uh, we, we welcome it. Um, so uh, we are using the same materials from the ball engagement session and pushing into existing meetings. Uh, so continue to get feedback. All of that will be compiled. Um, and, that, and from that, uh, we will then uh, be able to generate uh, some draft recommendations from the board. So uh, if you are interested in either tagging along 
uh, to one of the sessions because maybe you just missed our magical session at the fall engagement session. You want to hear what people have to say, or uh, you have a particular community meeting or organization that you think we should plug into. Uh, please let us know uh, because that is helpful information to us as well. Uh, largely in the report, uh, you can. Uh, read a little bit more about the actual like debrief. Uh, Darren did a wonderful job of uh, just summarizing the feedback for us as members. Um, we were able to rank like which take takeaways were rated like highest for people. They said like, oh, this thing really resonates with me, or maybe this doesn't resonate as much with me. I'm not going to um, get into that because I think the context for that is really important, and I don't want to be uh, misleading about why people rank things what they rank. Um, but that is essentially um, our report and what you need to know as members of the larger body. Uh, any questions? Not a question, but a comment. I just want to underscore two points. One, for the roadshow light, uh, just reiterating that this is for everybody to engage their constituents. We wanted to be intentional with boards five, seven, and eight. For obvious reasons, making sure that we're really centering the voices of those likely most impacted. Uh, but it's ideally we would love to see engagements across all eight boards. So, um, and then the other, I think the committee has some work to do just to figure out how are we going to come up with recommendations. I don't. I think it's fair to say I don't know if we all landed in a uh, definitive spot there, but that the roadshow light engagements would proceed any type of synthesizing from the document that Dan generated that would then lead to recommendations. And we still have to figure out what that process will look like. Just ideas, just to throw it out there, food for thought, that the committee synthesize based on what we hear, brochure your light and come up with recommendations and come into the board. Another idea is maybe the entire board come up with a number of recommendations and the committee synthesize down from there. So just doing it, I imagine that's going to be a point of conversation very soon. So can I just ask, um, how do we get the materials? Do we just reach out to you? Where the, which material? Sorry, so I'm assuming to do the engagement, there's something we should be using. Oh, like, yes. If the, uh, if that would be, it's actually the, um, it's the same materials we use in the fall engagement with the addition of, since most meetings are still virtual. Um, like essentially the e-version. Um, so we can share that uh, with all members. Good. Okay. Thank you. We also try to keep it uh, engagement like for our staff and what they have to prepare for us to be successful. Yeah. Is that good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vice President Thompson. I got to sit in on that session uh, at the event, and I thought the conversation was really great. I especially liked some of the things students had to say uh, that they were thinking about. about a strong student perspective. We did. Uh, education standards. All right, so we'll be brief, framed negatively. We are in purgatory <laughs> on both literacy and social emergency. <laughs> yeah. Framed positively, we set exciting things into motion. We're gearing up while the ball is in Austin. Oh, it's entertaining too. Yeah, it's important and entertaining. We should all really aspire. To thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Representative Jay. <Jenny. laughs> uh, are there any questions for Representative Jay about the purgatorial status? I think that was it. I think that's the. Uh, I think that wins. That metaphor is uh, really sad. Yeah. So start. <laughs> I should know I'm part of the that was brilliant, by the way. Thank you. And I think that was a great capture. I social studies standard. I'm looking this way. Can we just do a quick 10 second? Like I know generally we're waiting, but has there been any update? There has been no update. There has been uh the last update we heard was at the public meeting, the comments from the superintendent. Gotcha. We expect that sometime this fall which I am understanding needs to be broadly construed as sometime prior to December 21st, right. the winter solstice. We will have public comment on social studies standards 
I do understand that there is also uh, philanthropic funding that has been allocated that is supporting the superintendent and her team in having uh, an engagement effort in conjunction with those the public rollout of the standards to help LEAs talk about what additional support they will need from the state education agency to implement these standards once they are approved by the board. The board is not expected, the last I heard at the financial literacy hearing from the acting assistant superintendent for teaching and learning, Elizabeth Ross, was that the board will be voting to adopt the standards in spring of 2023, which I find deeply depressing given the upcoming midterm elections and what that could mean for the District of Columbia's uh, yeah. national presence of Congress. That's what was stated to council at the financial literacy hearing that the social state standards be voted on in spring of 2023. The last thing I'll say is that their new education standards person started at OSI this week. Uh, it is a former person at DCPS who had worked on academic standards and is now at OSI. And I saw the posting on LinkedIn that she has officially begun the job. That is helpful. That is more than, okay. So that's, that's what I got. Yes. The 23 vote, I was not aware of. Yeah. yeah, we heard it in the financial literacy yeah. hearing. Um, how will that affect the textbook? So this is a question that's come up a couple of times. So one thing to know is that the state does not adopt textbooks. So any textbook choices are made by individual school districts, that individual LEAs, DCPS and individual charters. There is no statewide textbook adoption process that would support that. Yeah, I guess I was thinking through DC here in my head. And um, I know what the textbook looks like now. And uh, it's, it's like what Lee was talking about as far as their video with the white kids from Iowa or wherever it was. Yeah, I don't know where they're from. I just made that up. No, no, right. that's, a perfect, that's a good metaphor too. But the thing about with it, the textbooks that are being published right now are not going to be effective with the new standards. That's right. I think one question that I am taking a, a slightly more optimistic frame. I think one thing that may come out of this gathering of LEAs with OSI around the draft standards is this level of discussion, which is, are there even going to be textbooks that will support the needs of DC, or will there be a need to think innovatively out of the box about educational resources that will better serve our students because there's not much use in having textbooks that are not aligned to our standards sitting around textbooks are not inexpensive so could we be thinking differently about the way educational resources are used in the district the box the box is in purgatory too yeah all right uh teacher practice in school school so dr o'leary i will get started and pass the ball back to you no, we have two asks. We are our spokesperson. We have two asks for the colleagues. With the colleagues here with us. But they had their copy in front of them. It was 7.35, yeah. One is, uh, we'd love your help to get the word out about the DC's Grow Your Own Program. In your schools, if you could email your principals, you let them know that this opportunity exists. It is our understanding that we have funded and supported this program, and we've asked Dr. Burton to come speak to us multiple times. And, and one thing that would be helpful for, for them is to get the word out about now a program that is available that we hope that teachers will and educators will actually take advantage of if they know that it exists. Our second ask is for feedback on the resolution that we have drafted in your folders uh, with recommendations from Dr. Mary Levy. And uh, we'll be pulling from that for the rest of the committee work to keep advocating for those recommendations. And Dr. O'Leary, I'm going to pass to you to talk about our conversation um, and then okay. your conversation. Uh, well. yeah. We had a very productive conversation with uh, Dr. Burton from UDC, who was a member of a panel earlier in the uh, year. And uh, UDC has a lot of programs to offer to teachers. The current, the master's program is, is free. 
uh, to uh, teachers in DC. I'll send you all of that information. Um, the one thing that we, uh, we're gonna, well, I am gonna be at the um, Empower Ed uh, meeting on Saturday. Uh, you probably, you all know about it, just to uh, pass out information about the, uh, what teachers uh, can find out about uh, getting a master's degree from UD, a one-year master's degree uh, paid for by the, and also <clears throat> uh, they offer a program that pays for the praxis test. Uh, there are a lot of really nice things that they have offered. So I'll get that information too. And um, I'm going to keep bugging her about that because it's it's a shame that you need to see is not looked at as uh, the premier education department. Yeah. So we have to advocate for that. Can I just I don't pause for one second? So I was aware that one of our members was leaving early. I was not aware that several other members had to leave early. We will lose Quora if anyone else leaves. So I'd like us to wrap up as quickly as we possibly can. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I want to be mindful about that so that we can keep Quora for conversation. So did you have a question? Dr. Just Larry? quickly, I guess similar to the um, presenting the governance stuff at our in our communities, is there a blurb or something? If you could send us something to, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then the other question related is, isn't Afi also doing a pipeline That's, thing? Or? We haven't, uh, you haven't heard anything. Asi doesn't, hasn't gotten in touch with us yet. No, Asi does have a growth, like, yeah. So you remember that council bill? Yeah, uh, they got yeah. so part. So yeah, Aussie's in charge of like grow your own like work in DC that's yeah. happening, and part of that money is guaranteed to go to UDC. Right. And then there was another pot of money that was basically it was like all the educator preparation programs had to apply right. to to be the recipient of that money for their own grow your own program. If I recall correctly, I think it was American and Relay that and Trinity. Yes, maybe it was that too. So, like, I forget the other EPTs, but we oh, just it guaranteed the money. So, yeah. Okay. So, it's so just we're just, as... we're trying to start a revolution in because it all goes back to teacher retention. Yeah. Well, send me a blur. We'll okay. Get going. <laughs> Any other updates from the teacher practice committee? I know you all talked to you about one of the resolutions that's on the docket. And I wanted to make sure we got to have that conversation. Do you want to talk about it now? I mean, we might as well because it's the last committee report, right? Uh, I don't know if anyone is reporting on that, but it's seen outreach since Dr. Reed is not here. I mean, I can turn that to report on the half of the Okay. We have the yeah, we have yeah, the update. Yeah. So yes, this is our last report. So wait, what is oh we're talking about the so we're gonna talk about the two resolutions to the wrong as well. Dr. Lear, would you frame the resolution that we discussed? Are we talking about the Mary Levy resolution? We're talking about the, the WTU. Yeah, let me ask one clarifying question. The Mary Levy resolution is on for this month or for next month? Um, preferably this month. Yeah. For this month. Okay, so members and members of the public, we have uh, before us a resolution, SR22, it looks like it's dated back 10, that would be about recommendations related to teacher education, a uh, teacher retention and workforce data, which I also think will help inform and probably has already helped inform the current draft of our testimony to the council mm -hmm. for the upcoming hearing. So please take a look, look at that. If you have feedback, send it to Dr. O'Leary and to Caitlin for the committee to consider and be ready for next week to vote on this resolution on data on teacher retention and the workforce. The resolution I had asked about was the one that you shared over email. Dr. Uh, Dr. Basoy, that I know the teacher practice committee had the chance to discuss at the committee meeting yesterday. Right. So I guess I would just say to that, um, thank you to those of you who have already weighed in. If you haven't, please do. And I'm hoping we can, we should be able to vote on that at the next meeting, right? At the procedurally, public. sure. Yeah. I just wanted to see if there was anything from that discussion that would be helpful for Dr. all of us. Say again. We talked. Yeah, yes, we do. But it was, yeah, yeah. So, so that's part of the feedback I got. I got some feedback from Representative. The Parker. one, the one that we we have a uh, some alterations to 
to the document. What, what happened? But I didn't see actual Got it. feedback okay. on. So what I would find okay. helpful so, is actual written like yeah, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, I'm on YouTube. Okay. Uh, I don't have. Uh, I don't. Think, I don't have anything. Oh. It's in not printed, but it's not in here. Do you, do you want to see? Yes. Uh, so. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so so only if we we're yeah. get to this. came up in our uh, in our meeting yeah. yesterday. Oh, which is uh, this is yours. Really, really and I had to leave. Sorry. It's all right. Yeah. We, so that's why we all have to leave. <laughs> no, I Because you are now our, our quorum. I mean, we talked it since we were talking about teacher retention, uh, and re teacher retention is such a big part. That's such a big part of why this WTU contract was important. We literally had a conversation about how we can uh, talk about why we care about this as a board in the resolution. And so, like that was <laughs> that framing was our feedback. Was like, how do we uh, talk about like we care about this because teacher retention is important. We care about this because. Uh, we want uh, like student conditions are important. Like, how do we make it broad enough to incorporate incorporate some of that and uh, be a reflection of the solidarity uh, we wanted to show? And so, uh, Caitlin uh, did a a, a yummy job as always of taking the thoughts during our meeting since we were literally getting one from teacher attention Thank you. to this uh, to try to get substantive feedback but i think we all got a little bit confused when, when we did see it in our folder so that i think yeah, yeah right okay so i this is the first time i'm seeing you so thank you um i guess i will take this back and i will share an updated version and then ask those who have not and, and so what we would like people to do is especially look at the therefore uh at the end of the at the end of the i'll share it all this and it's got because it's got choices on. Yeah. yeah. And so, Dr. Lear, would you just would you frame those since you know we can have this back and forth over email, but just frame the okay the, the conversation of the major changes so that we're we're at least on the same page with our previous one. We wanted to make sure that the um therefore was something that we as a board advocate completely as far as uh being supportive of the teachers, but really talking about what we would like uh, the values. I, I, the, the, if you look at the last one, the DC State Board of Education urges that the aforementioned values of centering students and improving teacher retention be a main consideration in the negotiation process. So that that just, that really, what we had before was really about talking about the executive mediating and stuff like that. And we don't we don't think that we should be doing that. I think the other I think the other part too is since we clearly are not at the negotiation table, like at the table where we will yeah. be, uh, we don't know all the, the nuances or the sticking points of and, no, no, and no. we can't and we can't. Yeah, you know. Um so we wanted to make it both like Yes, a statement of solidarity and uh, large enough to capture whatever is in there. Because we, we we can't we literally can't be in the room where it happens. Um, that being said, I, I can't imagine anyone on the board doesn't consider teacher retention important. We've been advocating for that forever. Student and learning important. Because we've been advocating for that forever. And I would be hard pressed to say that. To hear the chancellor, the mayor, the CPS, WTU, anybody else, and they don't care about those things as well. And I'm hoping that if the adults in that room can be centered in that, um, we can see some movement. Uh, but we did not want to, we both wanted to urge them to move forward and not say anything that would like blow up the whole thing, given we can't be in the conversation. And the, to get it done. just to add to that, if you look, I'll read it again because it, uh, it, it addresses um, the D.C. State Board of Education urges that the aforementioned values of centering students and the afore, the, all of the whereases have to do with teachers and students. That, that encompasses everything that's in the uh, buildings, the, the structure of the building, the time teachers have to plan, all of those kinds of things have to do with that centering. 
So I think that's why. Uh, and Caitlin just uh, surpassed herself on this result. So I knew that Dr. Gasoy needs to get going, and I want to be mindful. Oh, that's right. So ask colleagues to she, take a look she at this presentation. Anchor? and be sure that they can respond with any questions or comments that they have. We have another resolution, I believe that uh, Representative Wattenberg has asked us to consider for this month. So please take a look at that. The last thing I'd like to mention is that I am going to put forth a nomination at this month's meeting for Representative Chang to be part of the Aussie Literacy Task Force. Mm -hmm. uh, we discussed this previously, but we need to pick someone for that. It seems to me an obvious choice, awesome. but I wanted to make sure I mentioned that at today's working session be put forth next week. Um, if there are new student members who would like to join committees, I will speak with them this week, because if there are new student members who would like to join existing committees, I'd like to also put them forth for nomination at the same time. Any last thoughts for the good of the order before we lose our part? I'm the first time I send out an email because I feel like oh, we got new business. I try to bring stuff up and it's the end of the meeting. So it doesn't work. Um, student reps should be added to committees, in my opinion, through bylaws. It's a little more complex than just adding SAC in there because there's some things about nominations by the president uh, and less delineated below. So keep an eye out for that. Maybe I'll just send an email. Alex and I were talking about it earlier. It seems like it's a little more to figure out, but just, yeah. Yep, I appreciate that. And we are going to be we put that in the discussion for the retreat on Friday, a yeah. discussion of bylaws, how often they're updated, and to make sure that the conversation about the SAC, their student yeah. matters is included. And then the, the only issue is, though, is I don't think any other student reps are going to the retreat because it's during school day. During school day. Understandable. Yeah. Send us anything you want to make sure that we bring up, and we'll make sure that we've got that. Thanks. Dr. Leary? Yes, I'd, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, a member of this. SAC to the teacher practice committee. When does the teacher practice committee meet? Second Tuesday of every month at 5 to 15. That is uh, I'll spread it along. Fantastic. I'll reach out to you and make sure all the student members are included and all the committee chairs are included. All right. Seeing no further new business, <laughs> I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So and I've got a second. Moved and seconded. Third. It is now third. seven.